Hello, hello out there. <laughs> We're uh, going to uh, convene the open session now. We're a couple of minutes late. That clock isn't quite right. First thing we're going to do is report action taken in closed session. So hopefully you all have a copy of what what the agenda said for closed session. In case you don't, I can um, it, it'll explain it right now. Okay, closed session agenda item. Number 4D pertains to anticipated litigation re related to the district's conflict of interest code. Any member of the public that may be curious about the nature of the threatened litigation may refer to a letter sent by Mr. Bruce Holloway to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors on or about January 14th, 2019, copies of which will be provided as informational material in the next agenda packet or can be provided by the district upon request. The board has directed district council to request an opinion from the FPPC, Fair Political Practice Commission, regarding whether board members and any district staff are subject to Section 87200 of the Political Reform Act. Uh, can we have roll call now? Director Swan? Present. Director Fulz? Here. Director Smallman? Here. President Henry? Here. And Director Bruce has been is absent and has been excused. Oh. Okay, thank you. So are there any additions or deletions to the open session agenda? Yes, I'm requesting that the board uh, remove item um, eight HD, the Valley Gardens will serve a letter. Uh, from the agenda uh, at the request of the developer. And I would like to uh, request that the board consider moving uh, items HF, the Environmental Committee meeting suspension, and HG, Watershed and Education Grant suspension, to the beginning of the agenda, as I believe there are a lot of the public here specifically for those items. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, That's fine. Okay. All righty, so um, we're going to have oral communications now, and this would be on anything that is not on this current agenda. You may speak for five minutes, unless there's going to be a ton of you who want to speak. So well, I, I don't know how to weigh a ton of you, but let's... Can I see a show of hands? How many people want to talk about something that's not on the agenda right now? Okay, a couple of people. So um, we will give you five minutes, and I'm going to be asking this at various times tonight, how many people want to speak, and we may reduce the time uh, so everybody has a chance to speak. You will only get to speak once at, on each item. You can speak on each item, but you can only speak on each item once. And I would like to ask you, if you agree with somebody, just say, oh, I agree with what Nancy Macy said, and don't repeat what she said. Just, I agree with what Nancy Macy said, and in addition, I think blah, blah, okay? So that we hear everything that people want to tell us, okay? All right, so, uh, so who wants to speak in right now? I okay, okay. Yeah, Deborah Lowen, Lampico, and I attended the, um, Finance committee meeting yesterday, was it? 
Yes. Some really interesting information on, on the last year's expenses and budget. We're going into a budget mode now, and anyone in who people who have come here, you're interested in what the district is doing. I really recommend you go back and look at it, and then pay attention over the next couple months. The board, Stephanie, is going to be preparing a budget, and the board's going to be reviewing all the expenses. And this is where that rubber hits the, the road here, and it, it, it's going to be the future of our district. The decisions that are made. Um, I really appreciate the board taking such a close look. There's some outstanding discussion at these committee meetings, and I encourage people to go to those, too, to get a better understanding of really what the responsibilities of the board are and all the money that they have to take care of and responsibility. And thank you very much for doing that. Anybody else who wanted to speak? Uh, okay, John Ricker. <laughs> Uh, John Ricker, uh, County of Santa Cruz Water Resources Division Director. I just wanted to take a chance to compliment your district on the work you're doing on sort of addressing the sustainability of your water source. The presentation at the last meeting that, that uh, Jen provided really covered a lot of ground. I think it's really important that the work that you have been doing to you know, assess your sources, understand your sources, and protect your sources, both the watersheds, the streams, and the groundwater basins. And the, the resource agencies have been working closely. They appreciate the work that the district does. And I think that really helps them to have confidence in what the district's doing and give you guys time to address your needs without sort of coming down on you with a hard fit. So I just want to compliment you on those programs. Okay. Anybody else who... Uh, Bruce. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, in light of what I just heard, I want to remind the board that um, the county pursued a policy for more than 50 years, as I understand, of scouring creek beds <coughs> to remove all the logs, you know, mm -hmm. the deadfall and logs. And the reason the county pursued this policy was because in 1955 there was a terrible flood and hundreds of logs hammered out the bridge over Soquel Creek uh, for more than a year. Then in 1982, there was another terrible flood, and hundreds of logs hammered out the bridge over Soquel Avenue, uh, over the San Lorenzo River, and that was out for over a year. So the county pursued this policy for more than 50 years, and now they've got a new religion that um, we, we need to put large woody debris in the creek beds now. So now after 50 years, they've completely done up 180 and now they're telling us that they've, they've got it all figured out now. You've got to go install the, uh, the large woody debris. But I'll tell you, the number one thing that fish need is water. And this district has violated its permit in, Welt in Felton for 10 years that it's owned that agency. And most of the people in this room are proud supporters of the old <coughs> board that completely, regardless of fish, has violated its water permit down in Felton. Uh, last month, there was an article in the Good Times that featured Jen Mickelson talking about raising awareness. Let's raise awareness about fish. Well, this district's the biggest violator in the county. So straighten up. I'm so disappointed to live here in a place where the board, I see some former board members think that they can just violate a fish and wildlife permit for 10 years and then give lip service to raising awareness for what fish need. The hypocrisy is just unbearable. Uh, thank you. Any other, anybody else out there want to speak? Uh, I see a hand way back there. Hi, Virgil. From oh. After Deborah's comment, I would like to ask a question. And um, is the re is there going to be a review of that budget summary? It's an excellent bu budget summary. I've never seen anything better. Um, uh, some of the costs on there are, are kind of like we spent almost a half a million dollars on legal fees last year. Eighty-three, eighty-four thousand on. Um, on the um, the um, grand jury report, that's amazing, and I was just wondering if that is ever going to be up for discussion at any future meeting, maybe. 
Thanks. Okay. Anybody else comment on something that's not on the agenda? Okay. Um, yes. Um, yes, my name is John Solis from Felton. Um, say, I was wondering if it'd be possible for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District to set up the the meeting room with a, a guest Wi-Fi. Oh, right there. Right there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was easy. <laughs> I wish we could make everybody that happy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Password's a little tricky. Negotiate. Yeah. Oh, would you guys mind passing the password? Sure. There's several copies there. Okay. So, um, we ah, are going to uh, skip to item um, F and G. Under new business, and um, uh, the board will discuss things, and then I will ask how many of you want to have time to speak. So, item F the environmental committee meeting suspension that's I mean, that's been put out there like we're going to end it forever. The only problem here is that there is a problem with both, both board members being able to attend those meetings, and we're working on a time and a place. And we also have uh, information out there. We've got three people who've applied to be on the environmental committee. We don't have anybody right now. And one of the reasons for the suspension was this month there was an environmental committee meeting posted when they knew there wouldn't be a quorum. And people from the public, I don't know who they were, came to the meeting and the meeting had to be canceled. And I don't want to see that happen again. It shouldn't, if we know a meeting is going to wind up being canceled, we shouldn't post it so people won't come. That's the only reason for that. This is no long-term suspension or anything. It's just until we get everything worked out, which will hopefully happen in March. Uh, so how many of you would like to address this item? Okay, um, uh, you can have three minutes, okay, each. So, hands up again. Okay, uh, next to Nancy Macy. My name is Bernie McPherson, I live in Boulder Creek. Mm -hmm. It's okay, take your time. This place, of all places I've been, except for my home, is the epitome of who my husband was. <clears throat> he spent a lot of time here, and he spent a lot of time serving on the Environmental Committee before he was on the board and after he was on the board. And I appreciate very much that it isn't a done deal that you're just getting rid of the Environmental Committee. It was very important to him, and he saw it gave him a voice for uh, really important matters that happened from the watershed management uh, plan. Uh, so I really encourage the board to uh, continue to have that in the future. Thank you. Uh, Eric? <laughs> Why did you ask me if I knew your name? Chris. Just so you... My name is Rick Moran, <laughs> and I'm from Ben Lomond. And I served two years on the Environmental Committee. And um, uh, when the 
um, meeting wasn't going to be held last week, and I knew there wasn't members that were, they didn't have applications. I reached out to a guy by the name of Steve Davidson, who had applied last year. Now, Steve is uh, willing to uh, put in his application. He put it in last year. He wants to resubmit it. But one of the problems that Steve has is he's a regular 8 to 5 worker, and it's hard for him to make these meetings. And I went to the uh, previous environmental committee meeting. I, it was easy enough for me to go. I was a retired uh, teacher. So, um, but I know it's difficult for other people who want to serve on these committees. If they work, it makes it almost impossible to them, for them to make a 10 o'clock in the morning meeting. So I asked the committee if they could um, try to come to some sort of accommodation about different hours, and there was no um, willingness to accommodate uh, around those hours. And unless the board or that committee is going to somehow change those times, it's going to be real difficult for you to get qualified people who want to be on these committees. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who else would like to speak? Okay. Jay Gomez. Jay. Lompico. I also served over the last year on the environmental committee. I also came to the last meeting that was canceled. Um, I do have a full-time job. Um, I work a Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 schedule, and I do think that there are qualified applicants who, who can make those times. Um, I would be willing to serve on the committee again if I was able to, um, and I'm just confused. I don't see why this committee has to be suspended. Um, I don't know. I mean, th there can be a meeting with two members um, before another person is appointed. Um, I, I don't see a reason why the meetings should be There was the only one person. Suspended. Well, and to my knowledge, um, you know, that wasn't understood and the meeting and I showed up to the meeting thinking that there was going to be one it wasn't canceled because it was assumed that two people were going to be there so I, I hope you don't suspend the committee as I said we're not intending to we're trying to figure out a time and a place so that more people can be involved in this committee and there can be two board members there. I, I'm the only person on this board who doesn't work. I'm just lazy. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, we want to accommodate people. And that's why we're looking at having a time and a place, and the meetings might not be here. They might be down at the Johnson Building, if, if you know where that is. Uh, Next to Foster. Okay. Uh, Jean? I'm Jean Reifold. I'm from Felton, and I served on the Environmental Committee as a board member. <clears throat> and just to comment, um, I think the important thing about this committee is environmental work is core to everything the district is trying to get done, including capital improvement projects. Uh, this is a very impacted department. Our staff are just slammed with environmental work. I think anything the committee can do to relieve the pressure on um, the staff in the environmental committee is critical because permitting is the first step to any infrastructure project, doesn't matter what it is. Any infrastructure project, you've got to have permitting. And that's you know a big chunk of what they do. So I think the committee should be prioritized by the board, and I understand that the scheduling complications, I'm not privy to people's schedules, but I will say when I um, came on the board first, I too was working full time and I wasn't my own boss. I worked for somebody else that set my hours. But I talked to, you know, I arranged it because it was a top priority. Mm -hmm. Attending board meetings and attending committee meetings was my top priority as a board member over my nine to five. So I just urge you to get this going as quickly as possible to expedite projects in the district, to support staff and to make it a real priority because it is critical. Thank you. So we are going to be getting an engineer and a lot of the permitting that environmental does, the engineering will be doing. So that'll be relieving some of their burden. 
Okay, I can't see who's got their paw. Okay, <laughs> come. My name's Suzanne Shetler. I'm from Van Lomond. I agree with what, what Jean just said, and um, I think that the very presence of an envir environmental committee, I, I'm, it seems confusing whether this is a temporary sus suspension or a permanent one. It's tem temporary. But I think you need to maintain a presence in the public's eye for credibility because you're not just extracting a resource. You are doing good for the community. You're ex promoting stewardship among the community. And that's what the Environmental Committee does. Okay, thank you. Tony? Um, my name is Tony Norton. I'm from Lompico. And I just wanted to clarify so that, that it was suspended because there were only there was only one person that showed up at the last meeting. Is that the only reason what? it was suspended? No, that it, it canceled the meeting, but didn't want to see that happen again because until we get a place where both board members are going to be there, and we have a also at least one committee person, and we want to have more than one citizen committee person on this uh, uh, committee. We just don't want another meeting to be called when it's very obvious that it would have to be canceled. And That's you all. have no plans to, to permanently suspend no. this? No. Okay, thank you. Absolutely not. Uh, uh, we're still... Okay. Uh, you. I, yeah, I, I'd just like to add, I, I agree with what Jean said. I'm Mike Fresco. I live in California. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with what Jean said and this other young lady, you folks ran on an environmental slate, and the appearance is that the environmental committee is the least important thing. That's the appearance. That's what's coming out from this miscellaneous, nondescript cancellation. It's very vague. It does not appear that this incredibly important issue to this community is important to this board. Mm -hmm. It seems to have taken a back seat. There's a, not another meeting scheduled. We're waiting to see about other people's uh, availabilities. I would urge you to make this a priority because, it, it, because the, post, the indefinite postponing of this meeting along with the rest of the business that's going to be discussed this evening and the outreach programs does not bode well for what you folks ran on. Okay. Uh, who else? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, John Fasol is from Felton. Um, over over the years, I have uh, seen the environmental committee do a lot of work that um, that through the environmental committee and also through the programs that were associated with the uh, grant do a lot of work that saved the board, saved the water district and, and us ratepayers a lot of money because we get volunteers and so forth um, to do work that the board will have to do either way. The environmental work can't be pushed aside. So I'd really like to urge you to keep this schedule and then urge the people to, to come and get in to fill in the seats. Now, I'm not sure when these meetings are, but if this this was more uh, maybe posted somehow, so that we could see it, or um, <laughs> you know, so that other citizens could decide if they could fit in these meetings, and possibly there's a chance that there are people who are retired in our community who would love to step up, but they just don't know what the time slots are and so forth. Thank you. Okay. Uh Way in the back there. Me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris White from Ben Lomond, and I would just like to encourage the board to think past face to face that there are other options to having people attend meetings Zoom, GoToMeetings, Skype. We don't all have to be in the same room and might alleviate some of those issues of people not being able to attend with the drive, particularly if they work over the hill or in Santa Cruz or whatever, still participate during work hours, because I feel you guys over there, because I have to do the same thing, where I work at a public agency, and my evenings get taken up quite a bit. Um,
but that maybe think beyond the face-to-face, -face, that you can still be effective and collaborate and not have to be in the same room. And be carbon and carbon. <laughs> well, okay. and be environmentally conscious. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, didn't you, did you speak already? I did, but I'd like okay. to make one additional comment within my time limit. Okay, but I'm not going to do that again. You, you get to speak once and do it in your time limit, but I'll let you go ahead. You didn't understand. Go ahead and say what you want it's to say. Pretty sim it's pretty simple to find out whether you have a quorum. I uh, belong to a group that meets every Thursday morning to do some volunteer work, and the one person sends out an email on Wednesday to say, will you be participating or not? And you get a feedback. You've got a quorum or not. We do get that the day before, or two days before, a week before, whatever you want. That's easy. All right. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Barbara Springer, and I'm from Felton. Um, I'm a little confused why this agenda item had to be called suspension. And I'm hoping that in, within your discussion here, you'll all talk about, instead of ha suspending it, how to keep it going. How to, you know, how can you schedule the time so that it can. And also in your discussion, perhaps we could hear how you're going to make this, if you do find you have to suspend, you're going to do it for one meeting and by then have those positions filled and have a time slot selected so that everybody can meet. It sounds like this is a fairly simple, straightforward thing to, to accomplish. Thanks. It is something we're working on. We're trying to get a time and a place because this room isn't always available. Uh, we're doing things to, and we had to put out uh, because the environmental committee hadn't, there hadn't been a call out for a, a citizen member when all the other committees were called out. Um, um, we had to put out another notice, and people have into what the yeah we have we have been advertising on website on press banner. Uh, social media. We are in the process of recruiting applicants. We have three applicants uh, to date. Uh, it is scheduled, and, and the memo says all this too in the board packet. Um, the plan is that this will go back to the full board on uh, March 7th, the first meeting in March, to appoint. And then after that time frame, that we can have a meeting. But right now, we do not have a public person, and um, we are having a difficulty. Uh, having a quorum. We're, uh, we have uh, another location outside of this building uh, that we can hold uh, meetings later in the day. Um, so we are moving to, uh, to get this back on track. And that's all in the, mem all in the memo. It's, you know, it's not a permanent suspension. It's just until we get yeah. appropriate yeah. staffing. Um, and we don't want people to drive all the way up here. It's tough to cancel meetings once they're scheduled, to get it up you know, on the Internet, people to see it so forth because we don't know that it's the public that we worry about coming all the way up um, when we have these meetings. So depending on scheduling, we'll be back on track in late March. Okay, is there any other public? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Peggy Boche smart um, Are you also discussing the watershed um, Education grants at this moment, or just the? No, this is just about the committee meeting. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I would, I would like to add just one thing about scheduling. Okay. Just that. Yeah. Um, just that. Once we have a committee that's fully um, filled with public members and board members, then I do tend to, I always send out a, a meeting, a scheduling request for people to get back to me. And that, and that has happened. And that will continue to happen. And we'll schedule that we'll have a standing meeting and we'll, we'll agree with everybody who's on the committee. We'll agree to a time that works for everybody. And so that will be a standing meeting. I, mean, I just wanted to say that in case you have confusion about that. So now I'll turn it to the board. Okay. Um, I'm on the, I got appointed on the committee, and I'm also an eight to five worker, and everybody knows that, and we had this issue before, and you know, I'd be more than happy if people insist that these meetings need to be held during the day, 
that you know uh, we could do that. But I really, it's one meeting a month. They usually ask, I don't know, last one one hour, you know. And I, you know, I offer to have them at like four o'clock, you know, because working over the hill, that would actually impact me because I'd probably have to leave work at three o'clock on those days. I prefer to have them at five o'clock. And so that's that. I, do, I was pretty astonished because we did have two applications that came in for the, um, to, for the uh, public member. And we've, we've gone through these meetings and there's only been one and then we went through the meeting and then we took that application. You know, I insist that we um, approve the applications next meeting. You know, we have, what, three right now? Next meeting, couple weeks, we'll get and then we'll start having these meetings right away. That's one of the favorite. One of the big things was, and it's kind of the elephant in the room, is, well, we were, I was under pressure to, you know, because the, the, vo the voters spoken to me and said to, to ban glyphosate. And really, the, and I did say that the other side was pro-glyphosate. They're not really pro-glyphosate, but the argument is involved with how sensitive the sand hills are. And so my view was that we could do manual input. But anyway, Jenny Gomez, I know, is very passionate about being on the environmental committee. You're off and, subject. What? Not really. <laughs> but I'll uh, stop there. But um, anyway, we'll just, we need to get it together and get these meetings together next week. I, I don't know. I, 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 what, what was the reason? Why didn't we not appoint an environmental well, we I have, want to know what the re why what reason sure we have we a schedule we have it listed in the paper with a deadline that people have to yeah. apply and we have three applications well not but yeah. the right deadline's now. not up yeah we have Once, three applications why didn't we appoint because the deadline's not up what are you going to appoint and then all of a sudden you get okay. somebody okay. else we have a deadline listed when that deadline is up we will bring those to the next regular board meeting all right well next next meeting folks yes we will have we will begin our environmental committee meetings um, and I, I you know I, I, maybe it's too late now but actually I would like to have Jenny Gomez back on the meeting but because I know but you, we made that rule about not having because you're on the LADAC committee right yeah. so um, you know we made that rule and I think that was part of the agenda of not you know because we really wanted to get through this glyphosate issue and get that resolved so now that we've got that resolved so we don't have to worry about that anymore so, uh, okay. let, well, next—I mean, next next meeting, we'll get get your applications in. You know, more the merrier. You know, now these committees we're letting it, we're letting more than one person join the committee environmental meetings, and let's let's get rolling next meeting. Okay. You know, I I I've heard what everybody said, and I think that it's important to acknowledge what is probably most likely a big misunderstanding here. And if there had been one word inserted in the title, I think everybody would have been uh, sort of uh, maybe a little less uh, concerned, and that's temporary, right? So if it said environmental community meeting temporary suspension, then I probably would have had everybody read maybe the whole rest of the memo where it would have gone, where it explains what we're going through and all that. So, um, uh, you know, that, that would be... Um, something that we'll do better on next time and make sure that we're a little bit more explicit about what it is in the title. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, I, if you had been here a couple meetings ago, you knew that we actually have re-approved the board policy, which included not only the budget, finance, administrative, um, and the engineering committee, but also the, the environmental committee. So it was very clear that those committees were gonna remain in place. Um, but I also know that when the committee got, or the committee meeting got canceled, I was a little concerned because I didn't get any notice of it either, and I was, had communicated that if we're going to have this happen, we need to be communicating to the public prior to the meeting if it's going to be canceled. And um, I think uh, this was a way to try to not have that situation happen again. So don't worry, we'll all be back on operation in another month or so. Uh, just to just uh, I just want to just clarify: Have other committees meetings been canceled temporarily, or is it 
only the environmental committee that has been canceled. It hasn't been canceled. Excuse me, postponed, suspended. Excuse me, you're right. Yeah, because the other committees had two board members attending. They've had, and they had citizen people on them. They had a quorum, basically, so we yeah. could hold the meeting. Yeah. Right now we don't have a quorum. Well, although there's not been an engineering meeting so far. This can be on March, uh, March 3rd, 4th, or 5th, or something. I do believe so, yes. Anyway, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Think, I think it's clear it's temporary and we'll have yeah. it all fixed in a month. Yeah. Yeah, it'll probably be about a month. How, how about, did you have anything you wanted to say, Steve? No, just, the, just other than the fact that these, if you're not on the committee, you're still free to attend. The public can attend the meetings and participate. So just because you're not on a committee doesn't mean you can't participate and attend Okay, all right. So uh, let's go on to um, the watershed. Do we need a motion? Well, I'm not no, sure. No, there's nothing to vote on. We need to do anything. I think it'll take care of itself now. Yeah. Yeah. You agree? Uh, yeah. Agree. So the next item is watershed and education grant suspension. Um, and how. What? Are you going to suspend the meeting or not? What meeting? The environmental committee. Oh my God. You have it as an action item. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. there's about no it. committee meeting until we have it fully staffed. You don't have okay. two, two we don't, board members on, on that committee? We don't, we don't have two board members who can can't, that can attend. Well, we have two board members who can, can who can attend, but there's a conflict on when they can meet and where they can meet. And that's the issue here. Plus, we're looking for a citizen, at least one citizen committee member for this committee. What our process will be is there's not really an environmental meeting scheduled yet for the month, month of March. So we'll appoint, the board hopefully will appoint on March 7th, and then shortly right after that appointment, the environmental analyst will reach out to the committee members, talk about scheduling their first meeting. They'll go to that first meeting, and then they'll take the scheduling from there. Okay. So we'll be back on track mid to late March. Okay. So, okay, to item G, watershed and education grants suspension. Um, now I've we've gotten a bunch of letters and um, uh, people have said, oh, this is only costing the ratepayers twenty five cents a month. Um, it's kind of the wrong way of looking at it. That funds the uh, the watershed is fifteen thousand. The education is seventeen thousand five hundred, for a total of thirty two thousand five hundred a year, and over four years that would be a hundred and thirty thousand dollars. That is money the district does not have to spend. That's, and if you would have been to the, uh, the finance committee meeting, you would have heard we do not have an, enough reserves. Um, the cost of fixing the infrastructure has like tripled in many cases. When the board decided in 2003 to do these grants, there was money from Waterman Gap sale. There was a lot of money. Ten years ago, the district had a lot of money. We don't have money now. We don't have money to fix our infrastructure. And we are a water district. We need to fix our infrastructure. And over 16 years, this has been 16 years, and I don't know exactly how much has been spent, 
but if it was spent at this rate, it would be over a half a million dollars. It's a whole lot of money. This is a water district. Our job is not to hurt the environment as we run this water district. That's our job, providing safe, clean water at affordable price, not wreck the environment. We have two full-time board members, or staff members, uh, that can go to schools. And it'd be great if they went to grade schools. You ever talk to a, a grade school child and told them, oh, wow, you know, you should never waste water. Don't let the faucet run uh, while you're brushing your teeth. I'm telling you, that child would be right in your face and say, hey, Mom, you're letting the water run. So this is um, why I put those items on there. Not that I hate the environment. It's not true. I want to fix this water district. I want this, this infrastructure to be fixed for this water district. And before I go to the public, I'm going to let board members talk and uh, Bob. I have a couple of questions. Um, I noticed in the material that the current budget was about 32500 Yeah. Is that been the budget for the last few years, or has it been lower or higher? Uh, what, what's that? Right, so it's budgeted at 32000 or 32000 a year. Um, we don't always get applications for the data collection and restoration grants, and those have often, in, the, in my time here, those have mostly been unawarded. Um, so we have been awarding the full amount in the education grants, and those have always been very popular, but the data collection ones have been harder to recruit um, community members to participate with that grant program. So it's significantly less than what's been budgeted has been actually spent. And why, and why do you think the, it's been harder to get on the membership for data collection? Well, I think maybe the audience that we were reaching out to was more geared towards watershed education than doing data collection and restoration. There had been a few um, grant recipients for the data collection, but just not as popular as the education one. Um, the other question I have, or the other thing I want to mention is that the way this, or at least maybe there's a question in here too, but the way, as I understand it, this is a structure, is that each board member gets to appoint somebody to the commission, mm -hmm. and that person serves throughout the board member's term. Okay. Um, that is not done through an appointment process or a board vote. That is a single individual. The, the board in the past, the board individual board members have, has turned that brought that name to the full board, and the full then the full board has voted to accept. I do believe that's been the process in the past. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the ordinance doesn't say that necessarily. Well, I think that's how they've done it, though. I'd have to check minutes in the past, but I, I do believe the full board always approved the, the appointment. And it's always brought to the full board. Yeah. Well, like I say, the ordinance doesn't quite reflect that, so there is a <laughs> disconnect there, perhaps. Um, but as of right now, there is not a quorum on the Education Commission. That's anyway, correct. correct. Two. Because so here you have an appointment. I don't believe we have appointed. You have not appointed yet. Right. So rather than have a, a situation where nothing is happening under the covers, I, I, I'm glad we're actually having this conversation because right now the Education Fu Commission couldn't function anyway without that quorum. Is that correct? That's until you appoint. Until we, until we did, assuming that we yeah. did. Yeah, in the past, the board members had appointed on the day that they were seated. Yeah. So then there was not a, a gap. Okay. Um, and the historical information that was in here, the justification for this back in 2003? Yes. Was around the um, Waterman Gap Fund. That's correct. Right? That there was a belief on the part of the board at that time that a portion of that money needed to be returned to the community. The majority of the board. Which, yeah, it wasn't a. Okay. Wasn't a unanimous, I understand. Yeah. Um, and at that, 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 at that time, it was a belief of about a million dollars, 10% or so, was 
was the amount? I'd have to check back in a minute. It was, it was uh, what I remember of that without reading closely was that, that, that the board, the district took in a considerable amount of money from Watershed and they thought it was important to put some of that money back into watershed education or the purchase of additional watershed or capital improvements. And what's the status of that water and gap money right now? This has been expensed uh, mostly on uh, the North-South Intertie and the Intertie projects and other projects of the district. So basically that money's gone at this point? That's correct. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Um, it's helpful on all these expenses to think about all you really have to do, do is divide by 7,900 customers. And we talked earlier about meeting stipends. We wanted to re reduce them down to $50 instead of $100 because we wanted to have two meetings a month. Well, that amounts to district customers spending $2 instead of $1. So for $1 more, you're going to pay a fair amount for meeting stipends. And I would fair to say that most of my constituents would vote for that. But you see the number, okay, we're going to save $6,000. And then in Lompico, in retrospect, that would have been either $30 or $60. So that... Can you turn it around to what we're talking about? This is exactly what we're talking about. It says sixty dollars is either thirty or sixty dollars. In that case, if I being on the Long Pico board, I would say, yeah, okay. But I'm telling you, are, is it worth you an extra buck to pay? If, you know, that's a hundred dollars a, a meeting to 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 to, to do every you know what we do here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the education grants are thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. Each of you is paying $4 a year for that, okay? Raise your hands. How many people are disagree with uh, not paying that? Or do you want to stop us? Do you want us to cut these grants? Or do you want to pay $4 a year for that? Yes or no? I want to pay $4 a year. There you go. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm... I don't know if I'm Okay, well, you know, you know what? I mean, I don't know if you're I'm trying to, you know, sometimes I don't, I'm not clear. I can see a lot of faces saying, hey, you know, but, but that's what it amounts to. And, there were no and if you want, if you really want us to save money, the real meat and potatoes are things that aren't so subtle. And one of them is the uh, construction projects. Market is very high, so we're getting really high bids. We'll have another item up tonight about the PRVs. Very high bid. Well, we're putting together a, a pipe crew that can put that, do some of these jobs for hundreds of thousand dollars. Less. Our legal fees, all the legal fees are about, you're paying about a hundred bucks a year for. Once it gets over 50 bucks, you know, it's getting into, you're getting into money here. But we're talking about four bucks a year. And as far as I'm concerned, these grants are going to stay. Here, here. And the meeting yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to say something, Steve? Sure. Okay, so as, as Bob pointed out, with the grants were put in place back in 2003 when the Waterman Gap money was available, and that's gone. So uh, I'm thinking if that money was gone, that was supposed to spur these grants into existence, uh, then the grants should be suspended at this point in time. When I checked with some of the other water districts in the general area, Scotts Valley, I contacted them and asked them what sort of grant programs they have, and they have none. In fact, I was told that they have a bit more respect for their ratepayers' money and to be giving it away. That's essentially what we're doing. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz, which has, which has far more resources and far more uh, operating income than we have, gives very little and only to the... Uh, O'Neill Sea Odyssey program. The Soquel Water District, they have nothing like this grant program in place either. They have a $2,000 that they give out annually, and they have another program for beautification of certain areas where they will give larger money for business-sponsored programs. So as far as I'm concerned, I think that the idea of this water district continuing with the grant program, uh, the programs that we have currently should be suspended at least until the financial 
uh, malaise that this district has been brought into uh, over the past 15 years is rectified. And it's on a better financial footing. As Lois points out, the reserves aren't there. It's, and it's, it's a crying shame that they, they aren't, and they certainly should be. And every little bit goes to help the water district regain its financial footing. Sorry, Steve, did you say Scott's bad? Uh, Nothing. No. Zero. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> how many people out there want to speak? Okay. One minute. I'm sorry, but we have other business, so it's going to be one minute. And please do not just repeat what the other person said. You can say, I agree with them, and add your own bit. But that's okay. So, all right. You want to speak over there? You. Yeah. I'm Jean Van Alstyle from Boulder Creek. I was on the Education Committee, Education Grant Committee, three years ago, for a couple <laughs> years. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say I agree with what everybody else is about to say. <laughs> but that's very important. Um, also, going back to what you said about teaching the kids to turn off the water when they're brushing their teeth, that's what this grant did. We went to the schools. We are we provided money for different groups to go to the schools to talk about stuff like that. Protecting the environment, conserving water, blah, 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 everything that you're talking about on educating children, um, that is what the education grant did. So everyone else, go forth. Okay, John. John Fasolis from Felton. Uh, these educational grants, um, these other communities, the San Lorenzo Valley is a very unique community. We're not like Scotts Valley. We're not like Santa Cruz. We, we are this most unique environmental structure. From the top of the hill all the way down to the ocean, we have a responsibility that goes far greater than just this few dollars. The environmental studies that, that we lead our children into and that they help them get to understand and then the other grant money that goes to help do our scientific research and so forth this money comes back to us two or three fold so a few thousand dollars thirty two thousand dollars a year although it does add up over time if we could see all the money we saved would be really glad thank you uh, what? Can I, can I add on to my comment for just a second? What? Okay. Uh, he just, wait a second, wait a second. I just, I'd like to clarify one point, and that is that whereas I don't think that this water district should be funding any grants at this point in time, I, I do suspect that everybody likes free money and grant money, and I would suspect that a way to get the grant money that you like, and even more so, would be to contact the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Because they have the ability to raise funds and use it however they would choose to do it. And they have, can pull from a pool of the entire county, the city of Santa Cruz, the city of Scotts Valley, and San Lorenzo Valley. So you can create a program that would encompass uh, placing the burden and the funding on a larger resource pool than what the San Lorenzo Valley itself has to offer. And that would be my suggestion going forward. Uh, Rick? Yeah, Rick. I'm actually speaking for my wife, so I uh, <laughs> pretend I'm a five foot one blonde with green eyes. Okay? She grew up here. Um, the San Lorenzo Valley residents support schools. In 2000, we passed a bond for $18 million and another for $18.9 million in 2008. Residents are still paying for the pool, which is on our taxes for $49 assessment for 25 years, and then add $40 a year forever for maintenance. Every parcel in the San Lorenzo Valley, 9,032 of them, properties are charged for those 2,000 bond and the 2008 bond. All right, This adds up to over 600 additional dollars in taxes for 25 years for our residents, depending on when they purchase their home. Irrespective, they have children in the school. That's around $15,000 for every property parcel. 
Go home, check your tax bill. Residents are paying, all right? Previous board distributed grant money from the $10 million sale. The well is dry. Thank you. Chris, thank you. You. Yeah. I'm Karen Hull, um, I'm a resident of Felton, and I'm also a professor at UC Santa Cruz with expertise in restoration, ecology, and land management, and I've received no funds from the grant program. What I wanted to talk about was the monitoring portion of the grant. What I've heard everybody here on the board say is that you want to manage the property, the water resources and the habitat cost effectively. Well, there's a way, what we call in land management, it's called adaptive management. You try something out, you monitor it, and you find out if it's working. And I know it's something that Dr. Director Smallman has talked about and some opinion pieces he's written about. Well, to do that right and to do adaptive management, you have to actually monitor and learn from it, and you save a lot of money in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't pay, if we don't give out grants to people, I know that the staff can do some of that monitoring, but they're missing some of that expertise. It's a very small amount of money. As we said, it's a very small amount of money compared to what we found and everything else that will, in the long run, save the ratepayers a lot of money because we'll manage our land a lot better because we'll actually know what the effect is when we manage the land, and then we can monitor it, and then we can change our management to be more cost effective. So I think that we're actually costing a lot more money. The $15,000 is very small. Okay, Jean. All right, I'm going to talk real fast. Um, first, to Director Swan's comment about grants from other districts. We are unique. We have stream sources, and we have septics. Bad combination. Um, teaching children about water quality, where your water comes from, that's the best way to infiltrate the population as a whole. This demographic is a grand, grandparent demographic, but I've been to the science nights at the schools, and it's very popular. We really get the message across, so I think, again, cost effectiveness is part of it. The financial malaise of the district, you know, we went from red to black when I was a board member, and we prioritize this. It is very important, and we can't have our two full-time environmental department staff members out doing because they're working more than full time just to do the admin <coughs> office work. They don't have time to go out and do this really useful education. It's a cost effective way to get the message out to children who will then infiltrate the families and spread the education. And the last thing about this is because of the complexity of our district, I don't think the new board members have really got a grasp on it yet. Thank you. Um, yes, the check, red, black check. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Cassie Springer, and I live in Boulder Creek, and um, this is my son, okay. um, and um, I'm a teacher, and I know that teaching young people about the environment and the watershed is extremely important, and I just heard a lot of comments, previous discussion about how hard it was to get people to join committees, and I think that teaching the younger generation, speaking to what Jean said, uh, teaching the younger generation about the watershed will sort of maybe slowly erase the problem of not having people join those committees that we need to have them join. Uh, Tony? <clears throat> Tony again from um, Lumpenfeld. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, and I think that everything, that ever, all the comments everyone said, it, it makes such great sense, and I think it should be done, but I don't think that our water money that we pay to service us and to build our infrastructure, it's a mess right now. I, we should be spending our money on fixing our infrastructure and getting fresh, clean water to our homes. And, and I think that if all of the people in this room that believe in this should form a new organization, and I will help. I'm good at collect, going out and asking for money for charities and have our own group that would deliver this kind of education to our children. Thank you. Yeah, Jane Orbuck. I'm a retired science teacher of 30 years in the Valley. And I think this district should be proud of the fact that you have these watershed education grants. No other districts are doing it. You should publicize it. I've had students write you letters. I have teachers, parents, community members here. How do you keep clean water? You have an educated public. You have engaged students. And I know Santa Cruz City Water Department, one of their key members was at our poster review session just the other day, and he's going back. He was so impressed with what we are doing with your grant funding. He's going back to Santa Cruz City to see if their water department will implement this. So we're actually a role model in the community. And I'm really incensed that you're even considering dropping the program. If you maybe have fiscal 
problems, maybe you can reduce the amount of funding, mm -hmm. but as soon as you cut a program, you never get it back. Yes. That's yes. impossible. And I beg you to read all the letters from students, et cetera, because, and you really should push the model that this water district has set up in the community. Mm -hmm. Thank here, you. Here. Uh, Jenny. Um, I agree with um, what she said, and also, you know, this grant money is a fraction of a percent of the operating budget. It is a tiny amount. And it's not going to make or break any capital improvement project. And I think, you know, you want to roll back rates. Uh, we had this rate <coughs> increase also to help out with the capital improvement, and nobody's mentioned that. Like I said, you know, eliminating this program is not going to allow you to roll back the rates. Not at all. Um, I think this grant program is also about being a good neighbor and being a good player in our community and you know, engaging with the local schools and the children and, and, and teaching them about stewardship. And I think there's a lot of people in this valley who have a lot of environmental uh, values and priorities and I, I don't think that the majority of the voters who voted for you would be happy with with you eliminating this environmental program. Uh, Bruce. Um, I want to say I feel a little differently about the data collection grants. But to call these things grants, I think it really is a slap in the face of the public to say we got money, we're just giving it away. The data collection aspects, I think uh, that could be reframed as requests for proposals. Um, and I do think that some of that does benefit the district because the district owns so many acres. Um, one of the things about dispensing this money, I believe that it costs the district just as much money in staff time as, it, as you're giving away. So whatever you think the cost of the program is, double it because staff has to make sure that all of the Education Advisory Commission positions are, are, are filled. It takes you know multiple iterations, emails to generate all of those applicants, and then scheduling the meetings. Uh, during the five years that Jen Mickelson has been here, the first year I don't think that anything was done on this program at all. And um, two out of the, I, I think in the other years, both the grants and the, both kinds of grants were suspended. So I think only 60% of the time in the last five years have these grants actually been given out. Um, uh. Yeah, you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Donna Zeal, and I uh, currently was the chair of the commission. Um, I was ser I've served on the commission since it began, and I've been the chair for about 10 years. Um, most of what you've said already I agree with. I, I said in my first paragraph, Jane, that the district should be proud of the program. Um, and I have a written report that I'm going to submit to you, which includes a list of all of the the major partners that we've partnered with, and some of the interesting and unique programs that we've funded. Contrary to what Bruce just said, there's been funding every year um, since the inception, since 2004. Mm -hmm. um, the data collection grants <coughs> were not um, uh, created initially, so they came in uh, further on. Jen has been at every meeting, and she's been a strong staff member so I, I, I'm not sure where we got that information. Um, I would like just to say that um, your mission statement and your um, strategic plan speak mm -hmm. to your dedication to education and stewardship. And this um, commission fulfills that for you and helps you to meet your goals. So I strongly encourage you to continue. Thank you. Um, I'm Peggy Foshi Smart. I was also on the committee for years and years and years. Um, some of the data collection that was done was actually stream levels. Somebody took a kayak and went up and measured stream levels, which is information that the committee needed that he then did for free. And a couple things were done like that. One of the things was done, you said nothing was done for Scotts Valley. Um, we gave a grant to Scotts Valley for them to give out information at a meeting, at a big um, festival that they had. That was one of our grants. Um, we um, gave money to O'Neill um, 
also for them. Um, and some things real quick, Santa Cruz Museum Natural History, the school districts have got a ton of money from us, things that kids are still benefiting from. They got a grant, teacher got a grant, it's been using this stuff forever. Um, the, the, wa the, what is it, the watershed and the Nature Academy. They have tons of materials and things that they've been using for years and years. From the schools up here also. The Coastal Watershed Council, Santa Cruz City Schools, YMC Camp Campbell has a bunch of stuff that's still up there that the kids use during the school year and over the summers. The Mountain Park Foundation, Valley Women's Club, Please, um, um, Mount Herman Outdoor School, USC, Monterey Bay Master Gardeners, Sand Hills Alliance for Natural Diversity. Somebody else read this quick. <laughs> A uh, young man. Um, I go to the local middle school in Sorry. Felton, and even up to seventh grade, someone has come and taught us about the watershed, and even I think it started in fourth grade, and all the way up. It's important, to, as many people said, it's important to teach people this because we are completely lucky to live in these amazing areas, these redwoods, and like just. Miles that way, Big Basin, Felon, Henry Cowell. We need to teach the younger people, like people younger than me, <laughs> that they need to like understand how lucky they are to live here so we can preserve those parks for a, a millennium to come. Yeah. Nancy? Um. Don't start my minute yet. I wanted to pass this out. This is an example. Uh, excuse me. Don't pass things out oh, to the board. I beg your pardon. Uh, this is an example of what goes on to an education grant to the general public. Uh, this was partly funded by a grant. The Valley Women's Club uh, <coughs> met the grant money and exceeded it in this. So it was over $2,500 that you put in, and we put in more than that. And it went to every single resident and P.O. box in the district. And it taught them about non-point source pollution. Since then, we have recreated the brochure. We have republished it. We have passed it out. We have distributed another four or 5,000 copies of this. So it is going on, and you are not doing it all by yourselves. The other organizations that are involved do make a commitment to meet or uh, assist with the funding. That's an example. Um, your respect for the watershed and the residents who are dependent upon it can be demonstrated by acknowledging and embracing all the reasons to maintain and, if necessary, <coughs> increase the spending levels on the district's environmental needs and concerns, the crucial complex things that Jen taught us about at the last meeting. This includes the education grant program. Don't throw it away. It has practical benefit, and it is a potent symbol of the district's commitment to fulfilling its mission. Thank you. Okay. Back in the back. Rachel Bickert. I live in Felton. I attended SLV High School. I was a student of Jane Orbucks, who spoke earlier. I did the environmental, <laughs> environmental <laughs> monitoring program for two years. I benefited greatly from it. I would hate to see it go away. Um, I think it really comes down to your values. If you value educating the children who live in this valley and in the part of Scotts Valley that we represent too uh, about, you know, about our watershed and about our environment, you'll find the money. If you don't value it, then I guess you know, that shows when you don't find the money. So I really hope you do. It's so important, and thank you. Would you tell people who you work for? Rachel? No. <laughs> <laughs> A person standing next to you? Yeah. You. Yes. Nancy Gert. Um, I live in Felton and I'm with Felton Library Friends who we're partners with on the new project. And I just want to say that this afternoon I read through all the projects and this is truly a legacy program. Um, it, it has touched so many people in the valley that all of you should be really proud that you have this in your corner now on your resume that you, you represent a water district that has this very uh, forward program on, on the environment. And um, I think, I, I've talked to people in the Midwest and water districts, they, ha they have nothing like this. They know nothing about their environment. They don't know where their water comes from. 
their kids just grow up turning on the faucet. Um, we're different. And one of the reasons we're different is because of this, these programs that um, creative people have applied for throughout the years. And I just, I can't tell you how impressed I am with it. So keep our legacy program. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Elaine Fresco. I live in Felton. And a couple of things. I've just lived here eight years. And when I came here, I really didn't understand where the water came from. We live near the watershed. And it's been so interesting and it's so complicated. I need the education. Um, and I can really understand why this educational program needs to continue. I'd also like to remind you of your mission statement, which you have published on all your websites, which includes maintaining outstanding service and community relations. Mm -hmm. And I think that these grants fulfill that mission statement, and it's very important. And I'd also like to remind you that Fred McPherson helped start these grants, and he has created this incredible legacy, and I think it should continue. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Nina Moore. I live in Felton, and I've, I've gone to the science nights at the SLB High, and they're just incredible. You would be amazed. All of us learn so much from, from what the, the data that the children gather. And it's, it's everything from bee pollination in the sand hills to tracking all the different species with cameras and, and non-source pollution and measuring the, the fecal matter in different streams all over. And this, this is really important information to have. Not only that, but I got a grant because I live in I live by Fall Creek, and I noticed that a lot of my neighbors don't didn't even know that our water comes from Fall Creek. So Bruce will be happy that my I'm, I created an educational sign to to tell about the fish habitat and the fish you know reproduction cycle and Fall Creek intake, and it'll it'll teach people that they don't, they shouldn't take so much water. It'll, it'll teach people to conserve more because they'll know that it's connected to the fish. And, and, it, and, it, and it hasn't gone up yet because I'm, we're waiting until the Fall Creek Fish Ladder is finalized so the photos can be correct. Okay, back. That's what, uh, Don Alley, a 35 year Pardon? resident of Brookdale, Pardon? California. Uh, I've actually taken part in these educational grants, uh, 2005, 2006, 2010, during the time of Jane Orbuck and, and Terry Umstead. And uh, we actually collected data on water temperature and uh, data related to putting wood back in the streams. But that water temperature data we collected back then, coincidentally, was at a time when we had coho salmon in the stream. And our water temperature uh, probes were within 100 feet of where these salmon were living. And I could use that data just recently in, in our water temperature monitoring that the water district di did. And it showed that the, the coho were living in much warmer water than what people thought they did further north. So it was very important data that we collected and it was very cheap for the water district. I worked at a reduced rate and the students, they benefit so much. They, they get an opportunity to actually collect data the way it's professionally done. Uh, they, they, they publicly speak in, in front of a group, and also at the, at the fair, they defend their, their posters. It's just an extremely good um, process for the students. It makes them think that the watershed is important. We should all go to those science nights. <laughs> that, Chuck. Um, hi, I want to follow um, Don on that because I was a participant in 2011 in the data collection and restoration grants. And I'm here because of those. And I didn't get a penny out of that. I donated way more than a, uh, probably $500,000 um, in purchase of software and um, other accoutrements in order to get that job done. So I know they can be extremely cost effective. Um, the district does not have a financial malaise right now. It's in the best financial position it's been in decades. It has positive cash flow on this. and, the, and if it could get it through the, the prior times and had the priority of doing it now, this has minimal impact upon um, the district's 
finances. Um, one thing that's coming up soon is probably, ex or well, hope soon, is the exercise of Loch Lomond rights. That's going to make um, it be true that we're taking, we'll be drinking Loch Lomond water. Okay, and we'll be drinking Loch Lomond water that has been pumped out of the San Lorenzo River. So this is something that we haven't had to do indirectly, and Rick's kind of looking at it, but it um, will happen. So this is the time to educate peace, people about protecting the watershed so that the, the water that we're drinking in the future is the highest quality possible. Here, here. Uh, yes. Yeah. You. <laughs> Deborah Lowen and uh, Longhico, and I, I kind of want to go back to what Tony was saying. All these things are really fascinating, wonderful, contribute to our community. But the question is, is it the water district's responsibility? And I agree with her, the water district's responsibility is putting fire hydrants in. That $32,000 would put a lot of fire hydrants and upgrade size of pipes to get water flow. I looked into, we have a very robust uh, source of educational resources. I have teachers in my family, and I'm amazed by the watershed education programs that go through the County Office of Education. So I don't think that science is going to come to a stop if these programs are discontinued. And, and it, along with Tony, I think this room, this group of people, you are the core. You have the power. Please take this energy and form something. We have Valley Women's Club who has a, a very robust environmental committee. They were very instrumental at the beginning of this. I think it's coming full circle around now that, that water, the Waterman Gap money is there. Go out. I'm going to write letters to the Valley Women's Club. I'm going to write letters to the Office of Education. And I invite all of you to join me in writing letters to continue these programs, get the schools to fund them, get Valley Women's Club involved, get your group dynamic going. Thank you. OK. Yes. Hi, uh, Andy Benkert, uh, Ben Lomond. Um, I think uh, education, watershed education, is a very important aspect of what the district does. I think when it comes from the district, people give it a little bit more weight. It's so important that it's also included in the strategic plan, and let me read a little bit from that. To protect the district's water resources over the long term, it is important to raise awareness of water conservation and watershed protection and stewardship among residents of and visitors to the San Lorenzo Valley River watershed. The mission of the district's education program is to provide funding for educational and other projects that enhance the understanding of the San Lorenzo River watershed or improve the watershed's environmental health. That's in the strategic plan. I know it's going to be talked about later on tonight. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm Laura Dolson. I'm on the SLD school board, and I've received quite a few communications from people in our education community about this issue, and they're very concerned. Um, on a personal note, the day before yesterday, I was able to participate in the poster session for our environmental monitoring students, where scientists from the area get together to give feedback to the kids on their presentations and their posters and on the data that they've collected. And two of them collected data directly relevant to, in fact, on water district property, I think probably in, in coordination with you, and others very pertinent to the water district. I, I have a letter here from one of our former students who now is uh, the Outreach and Watershed Education Specialist for the Cache Creeks Conservancy in Woodland, California. Our students go on to contribute to the scientific community, contribute data, contribute in their careers. And if I understood what you were saying earlier, the original idea was that about a million dollars would be given to education and outreach Let's from the Waterman know. Gap sale, and that that has that. not nearly happened. I'm not sure about that number. That's not the case. Yeah, okay. I don't think that's no. the case. OK, well, that's what I heard. OK, thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Hi, Barbara Singer Felton. Uh, I think in numbers, and so I just wanted to say something related to the numbers on this. I pay about $100 a month for water on my property. We are talking about, it's important when you say it's $32,000. No, think of it, what it really is per person compared to what they're doing. This is $0.25 cents per household 
of that hundred dollars that I'm spending, ten cents per person. This is something we have only two entities in the valley that are governmental entities that are right here. We have the school district, we have the water district, and these are, they are an expression of our values. The money spent, the tiny pittance of this that is spent here does more for the district than for anybody who receives a grant. It's, it's a statement of our values. It, it teaches people how to live in this area. We see this when we see new people coming into the area and they don't have a clue what it's like to live in such a fragile watershed. Please keep this going. Yes. Yeah. Any anybody else have anything to say? Uh, Lou? Lou Ferris Felton. In the last ten years, the constant rate increases that we've all endured have added about fifty percent to the revenue side of our budgets, while the expense side has gone up by a hundred percent. And consistently in what gets left out or with, or what gets underfunded in our budgets is infrastructure, and that must change. Having said that, I think the best suggestion I've heard tonight was the one earlier that says maybe we don't have to eliminate the program, but simply reduce the funding and continue having the program in place. I think that's the best suggestion. I second that motion. Uh, anybody else? Yes? Okay. Suzanne Shepard, Van Roland. Um, I want to totally second what other people have said about this district being a, a leader, not a follower, providing legacy, uh, being cost effective, and we are building the constituency for the district and the whole valley in the future. If I, I could probably find four dollars in my pocket, in my car, my sofa cushions right now to pay my share. Okay. Um, thank you all. Um, I do have values. I lived, I've lived here since 71, and I can remember when the steel head were so thick at Henry Cowell that you could have picked up armfuls. I know what things are like here, and I do have values. I resent the implication I don't have values, but I also have <coughs> money sense. And in spite of what was said here, this district is not in the best condition it's been in years. Our infrastructure is in deep trouble, and we need to fix it. And every year we wait, it, the cost goes up and up, and things have actually tripled over what was expected. Okay. This isn't about $4. This is about $130,000 $130, over four years, or $500,000 over 16 years. This is money that's needed to make sure you get water. If, we don't, if our pipes rot out, if we don't have enough water flow for uh, fire protection for individual properties. I, I mean, that's what I'm looking at. I'm not trying to be a horrible person here. I miss the banana slugs that used to be around because of the spring that went on. I, you know, it's, it, it's, I like frogs and, and crickets and lightning bugs and whatever. It's, it's not that I don't care about things, but I, it's a waste of time uh, for me to try to convince you of that because you've just decided I don't like the environment. And I've just heard tonight your values, your values. That's beside the point. I'm talking about a water district and having the money to fix the infrastructure. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about four dollars. 
I'm talking about 130,000 or 500,000. That's what I'm talking about. Bob? I really want to thank everybody for coming out and, and uh, providing a lot of input into this. There's a lot to unpack here. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through it all um, tonight. But there were a couple of questions that I wanted to follow up on. And one of these is, Gina, under the Ordinance 100, are we required to appoint people as of right now or should have done it already? Well, I'm not looking at the ordinance, so I can't easily answer that question. But what I can tell you is if the board wants to make changes to the program, we can deal with tidying up whatever legal issues need to be done in order to make those changes. One of the things that has always um, baffled me a little bit about the program is how we get to understanding the direct benefit to the district um, and the direct benefit to the district's operations. So, I mean, when I go through the project, there's a lot here. It's a little hard to summarize and do some analysis on because of the organization. But of the money that we've spent, how much of this has been internalized into the district in terms of how it does its operations, how it does its planning, permitting, that sort of thing. Um, because that really gets to the, what I think a number of people were talking about, which is a direct benefit to the district and how it does business. Do any, any feel for that? And by the way, this is probably out of left field for you, so if there's not an answer tonight, I think this conversation will continue and we'll be able to, to try to get to that. I think, I think the answer, and maybe this, I think the answer is this, that it's, it's critical for a district like ours that gets our water from our own watershed. We don't buy our water from outside of our watershed. A lot of water districts get their water from groundwater. They don't manage large watershed landscapes like we do. We get our water from surface water. And it's critical that we have a population that's environmentally literate enough to know that when they take actions on their own property, then, they, then there are direct consequences to, the, to downstream. Mm -hmm. And so it's critical that our water district in San Lorenzo Valley have the environmental literate community in order to support the watershed, to steward the watershed in a way that will benefit all of us through water quality and water quantity. And these grants, they provide that kind of deep scientific learning that, that needs to start at a young age. And it's done by the people in this community for a very low cost. And it's done on a repetitive, in a repetitive way that the kids are getting exposed to it over and over and over again through the year, year after year after year. And so it's, it starts you know, in elementary school, it goes all the way through high school, Many of the kids who are exposed to that end up becoming scientists, and that's why this community is such an environmentally concerned and, and um, responsible community for the environment. It's not the same in other communities, and I think that, it, that, this, been, that this program has been largely responsible for that. I appreciate the background. It, at some point, I think we do need to get to understanding the direct benefit to, to the district. The San Lorenzo Valley Unified School District is in charge of educating our children. They do a great job. Thank you, Laura. I got a note from Emily, uh, which is great. And congrats to her. Um, what, 14 years ago, I think the environmental education in the country, let alone here locally, was very, very different. We have such a broad base of organizations in the district, in the valley, in the county that do this. The question is, where is that best done? So that's one question for me that I wrestle with. ROI is one, that's done. And then the means by which the education is done. In 2003, social media and a lot of the, fact, the internet was still fairly young. And a lot of people don't get their information in the same way that they did when these programs were started 15 or 16 years ago. And so as conditions change, how we operate programs, if we're going to operate them, need to change as well. That is, it can't be a 
continuous inertia-based program that actually has to be looked at. And so um, I, I think that because of all those changes, I, I wrestle with whether or not, for example, um, four-color printing of posters is more effective than um, outreach to the neighborhood groups on Facebook that I know we do. Um, I scan those religious, and you look at the number of people on them, and it far exceeds what we would get through mailers or other more traditional and, in my view, expensive ways of trying to communicate. Um, the younger generation is also different in how they uh, get information. It's much more video-based right, than it used to be. Um, and so programs need to understand and, re and reflect that as well. So um, I think um, that this program at the very least, and I, in fact I think you even have a memo from a couple of years ago or so that expressed some concerns about how the program was currently structured. And so at the very least, um, we need to take a hard look at that, particularly in light of the fact that when it comes to spending in this district, everything is going to be under a microscope from my point of view. Uh, because we need to direct much more money to the infrastructure than we have been over the last few years. So, um, I want to hear what some of the other board members have to say okay. too, but that's kind of where I'm Bill. Where I'm, Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, we're looking at these costs, it's, you know, $32,500 is a lot for if you're a single one person. <laughs> And as Barbara Springer said, it, it really is 25 cents per water bill. And then I agree with Bruce Holloway that it, it's probably more than that because we do spend some staff time. Da, 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 da. The benefits are hard to measure, but I would argue that they're pretty much priceless. You know, if I'm thinking about the young people getting educated in the community and like that. And um, and my other concern is, um, you know, I. Well, you know, ever since I've been on the board, I've offered cost-saving measures that are talking about saving hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they're not, they're, they're sort of subtle, they're not, they're not a direct $32,000 cut off the chart. They're more, one of them is, um, you know, having our own pipeline crew that we've been talking about in the engineering committee with things, because we're getting a lot of contractors making bids, and the market now is so high that the contracts are, they, I mean, they're marking them up right now. I wish I was a contractor right now to make a fortune. That, um, there's some things that people don't like, that, but I think we've been over-regulated on some of the uh, environmental stuff, and we were spending a lot of, of money on uh, uh, fighting with environmental regulation. This is a tough fight that aren't really helping the environment at all, and et cetera, et cetera. But there's, my point is, is there's all these other costs where the, the meat and potatoes. Why are we talking about? And when I when I, I said, are you willing to pay four dollars a, a year? I, I saw just about every darn hand raise their hand up there, and as a couple of people said, I wouldn't mind paying you twenty bucks a year, but four dollars, maybe make it eight a year, fifty cents a water bill. Come on, folks, and the the benefits are priceless. So I, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I think the vote's been taken, and if, it, if this board doesn't just agree to just keep this grant for, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you got my position on this, and I'd be up, really upset. But I think, I think that you've been let down because I, there, it's 95 percent. I, I mean, everybody rose, rose through him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was four. Well, maybe I was wrong about that eight. How many people on here want to pay eight bucks a year to keep this going? Maybe we should put it on the. Okay, well, it's your money. We control your money. And we work for you. Okay. Uh, well, as Steve. scientific as that was, <laughs> I still have a problem with the fact. And I don't, I don't fault the grants uh, per se and what in the good that they deliver. What I, what I fault is the fact that you know these grants are getting confused with entitlements. You talked about the ability once you end a program, you can never reserve, bring it back to life. Well, once you start a program, there's no way to uh, limit it. 
once the government starts giving out money, it does nothing but grow and grow and grow. And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. And my position is that I think, you know, this, this is a water district. It's not an educational foundation. And I think the education foundation, the educational aspects of the watershed and the district and everything else can be better served elsewhere. And I don't think it's the role of the water district to be providing that, um, that role. We still ask people. If there is a, if there is a uh, particular item that a grant is serving that is of necessary value, then it should be put into the budget under operational expense and treated as such. But if none of these are fall into that category, then I think uh, I would go back to my earlier suggestion, which is to spread the cost of these programs and increase them and bring it to the Santa Margarita uh, Groundwater Agency to deal with. The, the watershed is a part of the Santa Margarita Aquifer, is it not? Yes. yes. I, would, I would suspect that that would be the one-stop place to go to get uh, uh, to propose additional or the creation of a grant program and, and let it administer and be funded through all of the related agencies, the member agencies, and not put it on the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And that's my thought on the matter. Uh -huh. Second good round. Um, to address the, the vote's been taken, and it's 95%. <laughs> well, so Bastiat had a saying for that, right? What's seen and what's unseen. And what we have here tonight is what's seen. But what is unseen is uh, the rest of the San Lorenzo Valley that during the recent uh, election campaign, made it very clear to me when I was out there that they wanted any funding that wasn't directed at operations and infrastructure to not happen. And that is something that we have to consider as well. It's not just what's seen. I like your idea about that. I think that would be something that would be, that, that should be explored. Um, I don't know if people are going to get to vote on it, but I think it would also be great if the community was able to vote on how much they wanted to tax themselves for this as well. At that point, it would become a permanent uh, line item if it was actually made part of property taxes or something like that. Um, so that's another possibility. There's a lot of things that could be done, but I think for right now, given that the program I still have to come back to the ROI in the program. If there's not something that is directly benefiting how we are doing operations in the district, I, I have, I, I, we really need to start focusing on that. And maybe that's a conversation that we can have another time um, down the road. Bill? Oh, just real quick, I respect, I respect your viewpoint a lot, Bob. But, uh, you know, in my, you know, because, well, there, I know that there's, we have engaged public here, but in my heart, everybody that, um, I feel that, that, that this amount of money that most people that might, I, that, that would agree that, um, well, if it's $8 a year, that they, they would be more than willing to, pitch in that amount and that's I'm just I'm just voting on what I feel you know I and but the people here thanks for coming here because you're part of them that's what these meetings are for you know so we can get public involvement and I I, I, I feel if, if you know obviously don't have the time to go door to door and ask everybody hey you want to spend eight dollars a year on um, education grant money uh, a year I feel that I would get 80 percent of the vote <laughs> so uh, that's anyway. Thank you. Well, uh, sorry. Um, so, are we? Do we need a motion? Yeah, we we need a motion, and um, the the you can tell uh, Bob is the Harvard guy. And I'm the emotional person about bugs and fish, but uh, and about fixing the water district so there's water. If you ever were part of a water district who didn't have water, you might realize how important it is that we have water. So I'd like to make a motion that we continue the education program 
for the cost of $32,500 a year. Is there a second? No. Any other motion? I'll make a motion that the watershed and educational grants programs be suspended at this point in time. May I add a... This is a race to the bottom, you guys. It's a race to the bottom, what you're doing. Instead of, instead of inspiring the rest of the people around here, you're chasing the lowest common denominator. May I make a suggestion on your motion? Um, let's do a suspension. Let's send the program review to the Environmental Committee and the numbers to the Budget Committee. And through the process of the budget, we'll be able to come up and understand where we are with numbers. So basically it's a suspension, but until we repeal the ordinance, if we wanted to do that, it's not a permanent. Right, it's not permanent. Uh, re repeal. Would that, would that work for you? Sure. It's a cop-out. Yeah. Do you, do you want to repeat that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, Bob, you made an amendment. Do you want to repeat Well, what? the amendment would be to so, suspend the program right. and send the program to the Environmental Committee for review and to the Budget Committee on the numbers. Right. Two readings. Is there a second on that? Basically, suspend where we are right now is where we stay pending the review in environmental and budget. Okay, thank you for the question. No so, that would be a motion to suspend the program as it stands now, no appointments, no spending. And we send the program review to the environmental committee and the numbers to the budget committee. Do you have a second it or should I? Oh, I second it. There you go. Thanks, Lawrence. Okay. So, uh, Holly, could you call the. Director Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? No. President Henry? Yes. Terrible. 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 Okay, we have uh, need to go back to um, unfinished business. You want to take a five minute break? Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll have a little break. Five minutes. Admin committee person doesn't have Uh, notice of intent to adopt mitigated negative declaration public hearing on the um, CEQA pipeline project at Lyon and, and Sequoia pipelines. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Jen. Okay, so um, last January, January 17th, the board um, voted to open the, pub the public comment period for the mitigated negative deck, which is the CEQA process for the Sequoia and the Lion Pipeline projects. That um, comment period will, will um, close tonight at the end of the public hearing, so this will be the public hearing portion. 
And um, I wanted to report out that we had one comment so far that we've collected that was that was submitted from the Department of Transportation. This was not um, none of the comments really said any or had any concerns about the environmental concerns. It was mostly um, just standardized yes that does need to be done at some point yeah, at some point okay so i'm just wondering if we need to do that during the hearing formal hearing go ahead so we need to say we're open the public hearing oh we're opening the public hearing for this sorry yeah. and so um this is standard language about Department of Transportation regulations with regard to easements in the road and having pipelines a certain way inside the working inside the roadway. There weren't any concerns about environmental conditions that were stated in the mitigated negative. All their concerns will be handled in the encroachment permit once the project gets further along and if it's a standard encroachment permit that all those will address all those concerns. Just a little you have a question. Can we, during the public hearing, can we ask questions? Is there anything in the document that will cause us to do anything differently than what we had already planned to do? No. In this letter? Yeah. No. Okay. So, so oh, I, I, you know, just to get educated, because I know, and don't get me wrong, um, so when these things come up and we have to do this, because we had that other firm and that cost, what, approximately $20,000 to, um, mm -hmm. to um, do studies, you know, for these pipeline projects. And these pipeline projects are pipes that are already existing and most of them are in the road, and but they do go through da, 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 like that. And as you know, you know, this is part of the... Um, the issue that I have is sometimes I see what is being done as really, you know, as a contractor, you know, we're going to put up this, the erosion control, we're going to do all these things. In other words, you know, what we're spending all this effort and time to, you know, to, um, to follow the um, CEQA, which we, I know, I, you know, don't get me wrong, I know we got to do it and, and we got to follow the rules and uh, da, da 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 da. So, but my question is, so, okay, so when we have a project coming up, you take a look at it, and then you have to say, oh, we got to follow CEQA and all these rules, and then, and then you hire this other consultant that we spent approximately $20,000 to do, um, did, had all that data sheets about exhaust from a back, you know, I mean, just this a long thing all the details. and if you look at you know like the probation tank took three years and I mean da da da, da this, it, that this is part of the, some of the money that I'm talking about that hundreds of thousands of dollars and I, I care about the environment you know we all do and we and we, but we want to cut costs so we don't want to go overboard on doing things that are really not helping the environment. Does that make sense? But, okay, so anyway, so getting back to what you do on these projects, which I'm, you know, not, because you're an expert on, um, then you um, make these long reports with the help of the consultant firms, and then at the end, these documents, one goes to the, all the people in the county, correct? All the, um, it gets submitted to the, um, the county, and then it also goes to back to the CEQA, so to make sure that we, we get all of our. Is there? Am I, am I so missing something? Here? I, I'm not yeah. sure. I, I may yeah. not be understanding you, but so the process is for the CEQA. The process is that first we prepare an initial study, which basically right. studies all of the possible potential environmental species that are could be affected. Species that yeah. could be affected. Air quality. Water quality, any kinds of erosion problems, any kinds of problems that could occur during the project. Right. It's all evaluated in the initial study. Right. Right. That document gets submitted to the county, and then it's uh, available to the public. So right now we're in the public, 
the and that's the stage that we're in right now. Comment period. So okay. we're in the public comment period. Okay. The district, when we opened the public comment period, the last board meeting, we sent out all the notification to all the neighbors that are along the pipeline that might be impacted or might will will be you know some in some way be aware of the project, so that they would know that the project is moving forward and that we've done this initial study, and so they can see exactly what the impacts might be. And we sent that to the county, to um, various other agencies that would be interested in those impacts. These are all required um, by the CEQA process from the CEQA law. So yeah, yeah. To California no way around it. Well, well I know. Act. There's no way around it. But my, my goal is to inform the public to show them exact where, your, where your money's going. You know what I mean? Where your money's going to being spent. So, so the, the main dollar amount for the CEQA process yeah. is the is the development of the initial study, Correct. which is this, which evaluates what all the potential impacts will yeah. be. But this study right here. Yes. That's yeah. I, I think Director Foltz has asked too, and I think we've seen him in the past pie charts, which show, you know, the yeah. uh, the cost of a project, how much is environmental, how much is it engineering, how much is construction. Yeah. I mean, those are easy things that we can show down the road. But I'm just saying, yeah. These are, I mean, these are very costly items to the district, but they are definitely I just part think, of, the, I think the, of the process. The, the powers to be, the, the people that work for the state, the CEQA and stuff like that, they need to know that, hey, we're charging the public this money, and we're, you know, I mean, I'm looking at these pipeline projects and I'm going, you know, why are we, would, would this not benefiting the environment? It's not. It really isn't. I mean, there's not, there's not a lot of things that, requirements that are done from that. I'm just being honest, okay? I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong. I know. I think it's I know, debatable. I, think I know. It's I debatable. debatable. I'm not cutting you guys down. Believe me, I know everybody's like going, oh, you're like against the environment and stuff like that. I'm really not. I'm just saying, you know, I've done this work before. I've done it, put pipelines through there. And I know that there's some nesting birds and there's the, there's the frogs and the things and the da 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 and stuff like that. Um, you know, but it's all about, it's, you know, you know, we're talking about trying to save money, and here we're talking about $32,500 for an educated grant budget. I'm saying we're, you know, we're spending over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars um, trying to buy, buy these regulations. I know, you know, you know. We don't have a choice. Yeah, I know we don't. We, that's what you always say, but I just want to make, you know. I as, agree with you. As a director, okay. Anybody else? How about the public? Anybody out there have a comment? Mark Lee? Hi, Mark Lee from Ben Lohman. Actually, uh, Three I, would minutes. Say, I would say that uh, the secret process is, is not as complicated as you might think. There are three different tracks. We're at the top edge of the cake layer. The fast track is the EIS checklist. Once that's issued and approved, there's a, the, uh, de the negative declaration is issued and that's it. The permits are approved. You're on your way to the races. It's when you get into the lower levels where it gets more complicated, where you get into the environmental impact report writing, that's when it gets into the two or three hundred thousand dollar range. So I would say we're doing quite well if uh, since this is a lot of these are uh, a lot of these exemptions are on public for a public project, correct? Right? You're using a lot of public exemptions. So it doesn't trigger the, the more intense uh, mm -hmm. review. So I would say go for it. Thank you. Yeah, Bob. How much of this, if any, can be reused for other projects, either on a template basis or? Um, no, it's, yeah, these no, are all very very projects. site specific. Yeah. Site specific. Site specific. Yeah. Um, we could save money in the future by having actually people in the community who know the SEPA process actually do the environmental impact uh, checklist at a much, much lower rate, including EIRs, but we can talk about that another time if you want to save a lot of money. Anybody else? So uh, if there's no other comments, then do we call an we end close, to close the, the close public the, hearing. the public hearing? Correct. And it's a done deal. We don't vote on anything? <laughs> Uh, we, there's a resolution. Yeah. Oh, there is a res. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a resolution. I make a motion to accept the resolution. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sorry, could you speak up? I can't hear you. Uh, I'll make the motion to adopt resolution. Can somebody give me the number? 29 18 19. 29 18 Second. I'll second it. Second. Second. Oh, you did. I thought you were asking for a second. <laughs> sorry. There was a question mark behind it. Director Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? Aye. President Henry? Yes. Okay, uh, item B. Water Availability Assessment for San Lorenzo River Watershed Conjunctive Use Plan. And it's my understanding that we're just uh, saying, yes, we received this plan. Jen will, Jen will give you a, a short introduction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who weren't here last week, I talked about this quite in depth at the uh, workshop that we did last month or last board meeting mm -hmm. um, there were there's really three um, there's many findings in this report this is a very complex report it, it evaluates many different scenarios of moving water yeah. from the south system to Felton from Felton to the north system from the north system to the south system and and how that can um, address three major issues. One is the compliance with the Felton water right, the Fall Creek water right. The second one is to improve stream flow in um, the main stem of the San Lorenzo River for fish habitat. And the third one is to recover um, the aquifer overdraft in the south system particularly. And so really I think the three main highlights from the report that I'd like to that I'd like to bring up and, and you can read the whole report, and there's a lot more than this in yeah, there. Yeah. But um, I think these are kind of the three main <coughs> takeaways for me so far, is that um, it's really important to understand that the potential transfers from the North System to Felton to relieve the, the uh, water right issue, there are insufficient water source resources in the, in the ground when we're pumping during the summer and serving the north system, there's not enough water supply to be able to serve the town of Felton to completely alleviate the water right compliance issue. Um, if we were to take water from the south system to try to alleviate the water right compliance issue in Felton, that would be unprecedented amount of pumping that's ever happened in an already overcharged, overdrafted reach, um, basin. So, that, so moving water from the north system to Felton or from the south system to Felton to try to alleviate the water right issue is not really a solution. Um, the second thing is that um, the use of Loch Lomond would allow, the use of our water right on Loch Lomond would allow the, the Felton water system to completely comply with its permit from its water rights and it would reduce the south system groundwater pumping by roughly 60 to 70 percent. So that would be a significant benefit to the district by getting the, the Loch Lomond um, water source up and running. Um, and it would all and also the north um, the Loch Lomond could also <coughs> alleviate um, pumping in the north system, and there would actually be additional water left in that water right for aqu aquifer storage and recovery, which is a, um, a fancy way of saying pumping the water into the ground to restore the aquifer through um, aqu ASR, aqu aquifer, aquifer storage and recovery. And then the third finding is that with the addition of a Loch Lomond water supply, the opt, the, okay, let me, read, let me read this. <coughs> So, with the addition of the Loch Lomond, we could optimize the use of the North System and the Felton unused potential 
to restore the aquifer in the south system. So we can also use water from the Felton water system to pump down into the ground. So anyway, the most important part here is that aquif aquifer storage and recovery is going to be a critical component of as, as we move forward to manage our water supply sustainably. Okay, I hope that kind of like, this is a very complex report and I just wanted to kind of give you those three main sort of take home messages to think about. Um, and that's what this report was saying. And then I just also wanted to mention that about the match, um, there's been a lot of confusion about what we've agreed to match for this project. So this grant was a $300,000 grant. Um, we agreed to match $300,000, um, an equal amount. Those projects have already been accounted for and we've already submitted them as grant, as match funds. And so those projects include the intertie project, the, the stream flow monitoring that we've been doing, the temperature monitoring, the bowl pipeline replacement project, the fish monitoring program that we've already been doing, and project management. So those are the ma match funds. They've already been submitted, and that match part is it's complete. So we've already So we should that. be getting the money we've spent. Yes, and the money that we have also, we, we were administering those contracts for this um, stream flow, um, for this hydrologic study. We were administering that, the, that contract. So we, per, we paid them in advance, and then we will get reimbursed for that. So we've already submitted those invoices to the Wildlife Conservation Board, the grant, grant for, and so we should be getting paid back on that okay. sometime soon. And I kind of had a talk with Rick that it, it's totally possible to treat that Loch Lomond water and get it into our system. Now, yes. Of course, it's going to cost money. Well, but there's, there's infrastructure concerns on all of the scenarios, but, but right. the, the main part you need to start with is the water, and then we look at the infrastructure. Yeah. But yes, we can treat the Loch Lomond water. We will be able to, but we yeah. can't treat it today. We don't have infrastructure. Right. I know. That, I'm just saying that's yeah. going to be an additional cost to the infrastructure to treat the Loch Lomond water, and it's going to have to be done. That's a really good point. Can I just finish one, a couple more points that I wanted to make before? We okay. Take, and I'll take some questions okay. if you're still curious. Um, and then I just wanted to outline a little bit about the next steps for this process. So the first, this is the first real step is getting the hydrologic assessment completed. We will, I mean, if you choose to accept this, then we will move forward to the next step, which is to do a fish assessment to see how moving the water that, that was resulting in this study, in this um, hydrologic assessment, how that will impact fish resources. And then that's 100% grant funded. We don't have any obligation to spend any money on that. And, and the contract that we've already negotiated with the biologist came in under um, budget for this line item, so we should be fine. Um, I don't expect the district to pay any money for that. And then, um, and then we'll move forward with, a, if you choose to move forward with the, new, with the CEQA process for the inner tie to be able to move the water back and forth, if that's something that you choose to do. Which that is a real important, whether we use the lock woman water or not, to be able to freely move water with no environmental restrictions from our north to our south system. We have the infrastructure in place now with the north-south pipeline, but we, don't, we need to do the CEQA review. So that's a very important part of this next process, the process and, yeah. coming up. And the funds are, there are funds in the grant for that as well. So for CEQA? For the CEQA process. Okay, so. great. That's good news. Is that, are you? And so that's all I have, really. Okay, yeah. Bill? <laughs> well, I disagree with you. This, this document it really isn't complicated for me anyway. It's just, um, but I don't believe that we need, we don't need to vote on it. That, that's just, um, it's basically a study that I don't believe that we need to approve, and um, that sends a sig that sends a signal of approving this quote unquote conjunctive use plan. No, 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 no we're receiving it. Well, I, there is no plan out. I mean, there's I, I don't, I disagree. I mean, oh, I, okay. basically, I don't, I mean, I think it's make doesn't make sense to me at all to approve it at all. And that because the document was simply uh, as a report that promotes a plan, in my opinion, promotes a very ineffective an environmentally helpful means to produce and store water. I'm not sure exactly why the public is being engaged to de develop the plan, 
to solve this problem as it appears the decision has been made. It's being forced upon the public who have no, absolutely no say. Do not be fooled that this report will co cost $285,000 and the $310,000 that came from a grant. The grant money comes from our state taxes. So we basically paid $75 each for this report. If you have any um, alternative ideas, as I do, they will not consider them. I favor the more planned ideas, the better. And all these ideas should have cost-benefit environmental impact studies done on each. Ultimately, the public will choose which plan, plan that they want to pay for. Otherwise, they will be force their plan upon us, and we must start a protest for a free and open election on the best plan. Again, the plan calls for using 300 acre feet per year out of an extremely marginalized Loch Lomond. Many of you know that Loch Lomond typically closes in a low fall, rainfall year and a year or 20 inches or less, followed by years, and then it's closed for five to seven years. It's simply not enough water in that storage. The plant also calls for increasing surface water collection on clear water, which will severely impact the fish habitat, which we are trying to restore to its glory days. You will now see so-called scientists, the ones that wanted to argue that glyphosate was okay, and manual pulling would have an irreparable harm to the sandhills, and offered no scientific proof. Very easy to prove scientific proof that more water means more fish. The plant is called conjunctive because it claims to use groundwater and surface water conjunctively. We do that already. All water districts do. Most of the energy use and cost is to pump water from wells and divert surface water to a treatment plant and then to a storage tank where it's readily available for use. Raw water can be pumped to a reservoir and also be readily available to either pump to a treatment plant or for use of fire protection. I'm sure many of you have probably seen lines of helicopters scooping up water at a Lexington Reservoir to fight fires. The reservoir also seeps an endangered, engineered amount of water back into the groundwater using zero energy. I estimate about 5,000 acre feet per year. This is a total amount used by both the SLV and Scotts Valley. And the sand quarries are in a key location. They straddle Bean Creek, Cyane Creek, and close to the confluence of San Lorenzo Valley River. About one half of the 5,000 acre feet per year previously mentioned will seep slowly into the rivers as in-stream flow. This will keep a lot of the key pools in uh, uh, full of water during dry months for the fish. The conjunctive use plan calls to take surface water treated and then pump newly constructed injection wells to existing well fields which have been overdrafted. The reservoir plan would stop using water from these wells when the groundwater level is too low, essentially keeping it stable. The treated water which we spent all that energy and expense to collect is pumped back into the ground. Now, to use it, it is double the amount of energy and the expense to pump it out again, treat it, and put it back into a storage tank. The reason why this is being even can be considered is because of overregulation and because of a political agenda to stop reservoir construction. Even if all the areas are heavily scarred as the quarries are, this is now changing, and people are now seeing that reservoirs are not as harmful as they seem. The quarries will never be returned to the prior condition that they were in. And at the existing ele elevations, if the ground was not so porous, there were probably reservoirs there naturally. It would be an environmental improvement, not a degradation. How much longer are you talking about? Is this a filibuster? <laughs> Seems that way. No, five, five ten minutes. Most of the water Too used long. to fill these reservoirs, which would store of around um, 12,000 acre feet. It's about a 1.5 at local lock moment. Would come from the storm water collected out of the SLB water. This is what it looks like when it's really very muddy, 
and it takes doesn't take more than five minutes for the sand to fall to the bottom and about a week to to get down there. The silt particles are all negatively charged, so typically what people do is mix it with a flocculant and then push the water through a sand filter, and then it cleans all that stuff out. Uh, maybe I should drink some of it. But the point is, is that water actually will, would provide flood control relief in the around the, where people live by the by the river. Um, it have absolutely zero impact on the fish habitat because um, at times there's about seven thousand cubic feet per second coming down the river, and the fish aren't swimming in the river during those times at all. So it's zero impact on the fish impact, whereas the, your con, your conjunctive use plan does has big impacts. So it's very easy to divert about 1,000 cubic feet per second, and that's about 1.4 acre, acre feet per minute. It's an engineering challenge, I admit, and, and possibly a quite costly one, to divert this water to the reservoirs. And one thought is to construct a large concrete cooling tank, which is, would dual as a treatment plant um, at the uh, lumber yard, and then pump the water up in a 36-inch diameter pipeline to the reservoirs. A 54-inch diameter pipeline would be needed to pump this volume of water at that time period um, to the rest of the floors, I estimate. Bottom line is this report does not need to be approved. It's, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's there for us to study, but I think if we approve it, it sends a signal, okay, we've all decided on the conjunctive use plan. Um, I don't care what the public has to say about it. I don't care. What, what, nobody wants to listen to what I want to say, and it's going to keep moving forward, just like they did with the train in Santa Cruz. So because I, I'm almost done. Um, it, it it it's it promotes an ineffective plan, and by vote, voting to approve this, misinforms the public that this is the only plan, and we are approved moving forward with it. All the other alternative plans will not be discussed or considered, and let's just send a message to the um, Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin uh, Board that we appreciate getting, you know, we've got this information put together so we, we can consider um, the con conjunctive use plan, but please allow study and consideration for plans such as mine. Thank you. So just what, what does a vote do here actually. Staff, staff is not asking the board to evaluate the different scenarios um, in the report. Um, if the board wants to evaluate the scenarios, you know, we could put together a workshop with the author of the report and people like John Ricker who's worked on it and other folks that, to get into scenarios. What staff is asking, we just receive. We're not asking to approve, just to receive so we can um, you know, put this out on our website so people can look at it um, and get the report out. Uh, we're not taking any action to approve any one scenario. This is just, uh, most of these are existing scenarios that exist or could exist in the operations of our water system uh, with, you know, Loch Lomond water and our surface water and our well water. It's an evaluation of our system. Um, just asking the board to receive it. Bob. So I have a, a couple questions then. Do, how much did this report cost? It's 310,000. 75,000. 75,000. I, I mean, it's great that I guess it's kind of getting paid for somehow, not directly out of the subscriber's pocket directly. I mean, it's indirectly perhaps. But is there anything in here that we didn't know from a broad conceptual basis before we did the report. I, I mean, I looked at it, and I basically said at a strategic level, oh. we kind of know about Loch Lomond. Right. And we kind of know that Felton's constrained, and we kind of know that there probably isn't enough water in North Boulder Creek. And so this is the kind of report that prior to actually undertaking it in the future, particularly if we have to pay for it out of our own pocket, I would want to know what is the entire program scope and what is the cost that we're going to be incurring, not just as we go along at each step, but the entire program before we actually get into it. Um, 
I mean, when I read through this, there was just a lot of stuff that was sort of like, yeah, I get it. I mean, I knew that. Already. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, well, and so I'm, I'm just, I, it, when we start looking at places we're going to streamline, get more efficient, and that sort of thing, I really want to take a closer look at these. Now, my next question is, for the CEQA, where we, the CEQA application, so we can ship water anywhere we want, is this a requirement in this fashion as input into the CEQA application? The data that's being gathered in this, the, the CEQA, I'm not sure what route the CEQA will require. If, it's, if, it, if it gets deemed that we have to do an EIR, then this, uh, this study and the FISH study will both be important aspects of the environmental impact report. I'm not sure if that'll be required or if we can do a mitigated negative deck. I hope we can do a mitigated negative deck, but I don't really know. Okay, but, but my point is, is that I want, at least from my perspective, again, this is my opinion, I'd like us to be very rifle shot in, in what it is that we're going to undertake because it's not just the cost of the study, it's also your time and everybody else's time that goes along with it. And um, we need to be focused on doing exactly what's necessary, no more, no less, to be able to get through these steps. Now, if this is necessary, I get it, but it's not clear to me that it is at this point. Um, I would be happy to make sure that we look at options other than the injection well. I'm not saying that I'm in favor of it. I think you're in favor of it. I'm not in favor of it necessarily, but I'd be happy to take a look at that. Um, and I would be happy to receive this report, but not accept the report because that's actually what is in the recommendation is to accept it. I'd be happy to receive it, and I would want to make sure that if we post it on the website, um, that it's posted with context around the fact that this is raw material into a broader discussion. This is not a set of conclusions that the board has made yet. I make a motion that we receive this. Uh yeah, and just one quick, one quick answer, Bob. There is a lot of good information in here, Bob, that we will use. You know, the, the amount of surface water that's available off our watershed um, to be able to use to move from one end of the district to the other. You know, we've always had you know, some rough ideas, but quite frankly, when Nick did his his reviews of the watershed and the streams and so forth, there wasn't as much water as we thought. And these are great. Great information to have as we move ahead, planning on our water budget and, and how we're going to solve our problems. I get that. Um, really narrow, great information. I get that, but a narrower study around that might be a different cost than seventy-five thousand. Right, and so that's what I'm talking about in terms of rifle shot and how we're planning, what we're doing, and how we're spending money. Right now, we get this kind of covered, so it's freebie money, except maybe for our income taxes. But that's not going to be the case always going forward. Not necessarily. Yeah, I, I think the district would have pushed forward for this same study, grant money or not, quite frankly, to know this information from our watershed. Um, Possibly. I, I think there would have been a, a big push to know uh, what we're looking at and, and, and doing our water planning. I'm not saying that I wouldn't have uh, voted for it. No, I, I wanted more information about what it is we're going well, to get. you agree with that? For sure. Um, and I think this information that will be used, it will be used when we do all of our planning with the state regulatory agencies on our, our, our uh, extractions from the different streams and the amount. I mean, this is all information that, yeah, we probably, you know, we had a great idea, but until you had it down in this report, down in this matter. Um, Grant you, Nick's reports are thorough and there's a lot to it, um, but I, I think this information will be used for, for some time. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that over and over again. <laughs> okay. All righty. How about the public? Any comments out there? Uh, Bruce? Um, I have not read the report, so I wasn't aware of what, what really was here. And it sounds pretty interesting. Um, it's on the website. Well, of course, it's in the agenda packet, right? Yeah. Actually, I'm having trouble reading a 500-page file, even with the... Uh, the free wireless. <laughs> you used to put different agenda items as separate little things that you could click on, but this is such a big thing, it's, it's very hard to scroll and read it. 
Um, with my little phone. Um, I kind of think the district's in an untenable position here. You are continuing to violate your permit. And you seem to think that life's just going to go on that way. You've been doing it ever since you bought Felton. And you just seem to think, hey, it's not a big deal. We're just going to go on violating our permit. Um, and I just think that's completely an untenable position. I'm pretty sure that the State Water Board can come in and they can start charging you $10,000 a day for what you're doing in Felton. And you can add that up for a year, and it's not an amount that you're going to want to pay. So it's just a matter of time until the state wakes up and says, wait a minute, we've got a water agency here that's just stepping all over its permit. They don't care at all. And this district's had a history of this kind of stuff. How about the Vieira letter? Oh, let's just keep that secret. You know, we're going to have our own public records policy that's not consistent with state law. That's just the way this district was. Um, so I think you need to wake up. You need to wake up and you need to take positive action. You, you ought to be going back to the State Water Board and saying, it's too hard. We're never going to be able to comply. Let us out somehow. Let us out. Let us do something different. Um, what I remember from reading that, uh, that uh, see, there was a 10-year process that led to those water rights. And you know, the city of Santa Cruz, the county of Santa Cruz, were heavily involved back in the 1970s. Um, you know, you're just not honoring the process. Uh, okay, so before that water right was established, Felton had rights to about 400 acre feet down there. Uh, without any condition like this. And, and I think, I don't even think that Felton ever got up to 600 acre feet uh, of consumption. So, you know, if you could go back to pre-1970, there was 400 acre feet down there with no restriction at all. And, I mean, that would be a fallback position. That would be, that would be something to go to the state and say, okay, We've got this report now that says we're never going to be able to comply with this condition. So how about change the condition so that we stay like 400 acre feet per day, that would be, you know, divide by 365, that would be like one acre foot per day. So can we at least have one acre foot per day with no restriction? Um, I mean, you, you have to work to bring yourself in compliance. I just don't understand this attitude of we're just going to keep on violating the permit. I, I just don't understand this point of view. You know, if you had a truck that was not complying with the vehicle code, and I saw it driving down the highway every day, and I know it's not complying with the vehicle code, and I bring it up again and again, and you just say, shucks, I don't know what to do, you know? Um, when, do you, when do you wake up? When do you say, yeah, we're going to be the kind of agency that complies with state law. We're not going to just walk all over this permit. We're not going to go give lip service to protecting fish while we know we're violating our permit. Um, another thing is, this permit, it's, it's really, the condition is on a day-by-day -day basis. So even this consequence sounded so dire, oh, you can't do it from the north system, you can't do it from the south system. But remember, it's really only happening on a daily basis. Uh, if, if it rains in one day in October and it doesn't rain another day, you may be in compliance for certain days in the month, you may be out of compliance for certain days of the month. So I, Somehow I can't really believe that it's just impossible. That all you can say is, no, we're going to be the kind of agency that just doesn't comply. We're just going to keep on doing it for another 10 years. You've got to bring this thing into compliance. City of Santa Cruz, I think it's a joke, isn't it? You've been here five years and you're happy with this. You're happy to not comply with the permit for five years. Um, the city of Santa Cruz is showing that they're being proactive in trying to adjust the terms of their water permit in Felton. And I wish that this district had already gotten started years ago and been a leader in this instead of a follower and a violator. Thank you. Any other, uh, Chris? Um, Chris Finney, Boulder Creek. Um, I just have a question for Director Smallman. You mentioned they are going to make us do this, and they are going to do this, and they are going to do that. And I, I just wondered what they you were talking about. I didn't understand. 
Um, it's basically the, the state and the, um, all the work that we've done. We brought, we 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 well, we, we're, we spent what seventy five thousand dollars for this plan, and then we've had all those out. You know, we, there was one more meeting at the community hall, but what what my what I envision is that if anybody in the public wants to say, hey, like me. Why, why are we looking at it? I'm not saying my reservoir idea is the, you know, going to win, but it's not It's not going to consider. And then maybe there's some other people that have other ideas. And I was just pointing out that this ASR is, quite frankly, it's, you know, as a civil engineer, it's idiotic. It's, you know, where you're going to use twice as much energy. And then we're, I, well, when I, you know, had that long speech about, how I think that my feelings is that it's going to affect the fish habitat. And I basically think that building reservoirs, although I know that a lot of people don't want to do that, I, I just think it's a better plan. And I think it deserves being heard. So, I don't, you know, I, I'm still the not they, the they, the they the is, is the, the they is the political, is oh, okay. everybody. It's the, it's the, it's the Santa Mark, it's the, it's uh, everybody that's involved uh, with making these decisions. That's the political body of the, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Management Agency. Oh, okay. So thank you. Uh, John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things. I mean, one thing just to respond to Mr. Holloway, the, the district inherited that problem at Felton, and the district, I think, has really been trying to address that. This, this study, this, this project, is one of those efforts to try to figure out a way to solve that. I mean, the district has not just been sitting back. Um, they're working on the fish ladder, restoring the fish ladder. The state knows that the district's in violation of that, and the state knows that the district is taking proactive measures to try to address all of their diversions, including the felt diversion, and to, to minimize the impact of that. This, this grant was a grant that came to the district and to the county to actually increase stream flows and increase fish habitat. It's a stream flow enhancement grant from the State Wildlife Conservation Board. We looked at it a way to also answer questions for the district in terms of long-term supply reliability, both through liability and fish habitat. Try to try to maximize both of those. Um, the report that's before you tonight is one part of that. It's a very key part of it. I think Rick really hit the nail on the head. This is good quantitative information on what might work and what might not work. It lets you know where you've got water and where you don't have water and places where you can put it where you where it really doesn't do you any good. So there aren't there's not a plan in this document. There's an analysis of, of different scenarios and whether those would work and whether they would accomplish the goals or not. So it gives you sort of a information to go forward, but it doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you some information to evaluate and you know other things can also be brought into the the mix in terms of evaluating alternatives that weren't covered in this. The, the grant agreement, or the, you know, it, it, we kind of told the state what we were going to evaluate, so we're somewhat bound by uh, the terms of the grant agreement. But uh, it is very thorough. It lets us know that some things we thought might work probably won't do what we hoped they would do, and other things maybe, you know, they probably will. So uh, it lays the groundwork for moving forward and to do the environmental work and also to talk with the state resource agencies about what it's going to take to be able to move water back and forth through the through the inner ties as needed to help give your system more resilience and also hopefully benefit excuse me benefit the fish at the same time okay thank you uh <coughs> yeah you mark lee uh hi mark lee from gentlemen i've read the report several times uh, <coughs> i am very disappointed the report is very spacious. The data collection is good. It only goes back to 1970. So we have some general, general summaries of data that, are, if you look at the report, actually on page 55, if everyone will turn to that page, the limitations John has laid out here, he says we can't rely on this data. This data has been uh, essentially estimated. We have, uh, he has limitations he's de declaring should not be used for evaluating his synthesized monthly records of water supply or used to have limited precision and should not be used to evaluate compliance with regulatory water rights and habitat requirements. 
He goes on to further say the alternatives are evaluated under optimal hypothetical conditions with full regard for infrastructure and operational limitations, whatever that means, and like, such likely overestimates the potential yields. Go to page 55. The yield, uh, he goes on to say, actual yield of the existing future infrastructures will depend on numerous factors beyond the scope of this analysis. This is a very vague report. I, don't, I, I wouldn't even pay a dime for this. The data is good, fine, but we wasted a lot of money here. He says the approach, he goes on to say, the, report, a report, the approach used to evaluate and compare conjunctive use and alternatives does not consider this effect on stream diversions. What is the report for? Or groundwater pumping other than San Lorenzo Valley Water District? What is the report for? Beyond the, stip, the, stip, the simplified approach used by this study, evaluating the effects of groundwater pumping on stream water requires use of calibrated numerical groundwater flow models. Fine which on the outside of the scope, which is outside the scope of this study. The conjunctive use alternatives are evaluated and compared to the basis of 1970 to 2070. That's 37 years, roughly, not 48. The climate period, which was considered climate. So I looked at the data, and we're looking at a, a, a drought occurring about every five and a half to six years. Out of 48 years cited in here, we only had 10 years of drought. So I think this is manufactured. I agree with uh, Bill Smallman's assessment that ASR is a waste of money, and everyone better wake up to the fact you're putting money, you're putting water into a ground well that's going to sandstone, that's going to be sucked up, and somehow miraculously it's going to drain back into the water system. It has never been tr proven. UC Davis, where I attended, groundwater injection systems are still hypothetical. They're still experimental. It's a lot of money to be spending. I think we ought to say, okay, we'll accept this report, but, but we need to go back to the we need to go back to the engineering and environmental group, and, a, and particularly the budget group, to determine the true cost of what this the implications are of this. Thank you. Thank I would you. reject this report. Yes. I just have a question. Um, when was this project started? We got the grant. I believe it. it when did we apply for the grant? I think we applied for the grant in August of 2016 or something. It didn't get like awarded until early, mid, like spring of 2017, and then it didn't get initiated. Like the grant funds kind of started around August of 2017. Mm -hmm. And then we started an RFP process to hire the consultants to do these analyses, the hydrologic assessment and the fish assessment. So those were done in 2018. Okay. So it's been a process. <laughs> okay. So uh, can we just... Yeah, oh. Yes, who, yes, who? Very short. And I'm oh. glad Mark brought this up because I was going to mention it, but you said it so much better and I'll just say... You know, I, I read through the report, I, I realized that it's quite a lot of data, it's data collection, and I realized what Rick said, that's valuable stuff. But I got stuck on that same phrase, this is a high level view, overview that cannot be used for planning. What the heck are we doing with it then? Totally. You know? <laughs> and, it, later. and that this needs a more focused study, to me that says, we're going to need to put more money into this, and probably a lot more money, because this report is only just skimming the surface. It's a skimmer. And, uh, I was not impressed with it, and I, I would like it explained to me what value this had besides just collecting all the data that a lot of it the district already had that was collected in one spot by somebody. What, what value is it? Okay. It's, uh, well, it, it's a, essentially a feasibility study of a range of alternatives. That's pretty standard disclaimer language for most consultants. What you then do is, when, based on that, you get a sense of what's most likely to succeed, and then you can do your more detailed work. You don't do the detailed work on everything possible, but you narrow it down to what's the most feasible, and that's where you do your more detailed uh, planning assessment. I, I, I give you a little shot at it again, but don't make it very long. <laughs> Once again, the alternatives that John, this, this director is referring to, the first three seem to be reasonable. The last one is the one I'm having difficulty. We're talking about using injection wells. It doesn't work, particularly in the sandstone. I'm telling you, they're doing it down in Soquel, and it's going to be $2 million wasted. 
it doesn't work. Okay, we need to include in the alternatives the use of reservoirs in the quarries. Okay. That is missing from this report. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, so uh, what do we need to do to accept this I, I report? Would, I, would, I would like to make a motion that we receive the receive this. That we receive uh, this report, which is the final water availability assessment for conjunctive use plan for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And if it is posted on the website, I would like it posted with reservations. Context that says this does not reflect a final decision on the part of the board. Sure. Okay. Just second? don't go on. Yeah. Sorry, is there a second? Or are we no. Yeah, is there well, a second? Is, the report. We the, got a second. Again, the report is, again, it's really not that complicated. It's collecting more surface water from clear streams. ASR, which you're against, and using 300 acre feet a year out of Lock Bonham. Again. Which I'm at. And that's that. They're going to, somehow there's going to, you can from this data pick and choose, you know, because the surface water all comes from all different locations. It doesn't consider anything to do with my plan about building residents. Okay. Residence. Get, we got an ocean and a second, so. So I don't think it needs to be voted on. Yeah, it just is, we're receiving it. Director Spahn? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smallman? No. President Henry? Yes. <clears throat> Motion passed. Okay, so. <laughs> um, Special District Risk Management Agency election nominations. So does anybody want to make, uh, think they want to make a nomination? Oh. No. 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 I can't. She's going to try to second. I, 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 I couldn't even see where I am at the time being. Yeah. yeah. It's after hours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they, we don't have anybody to nominate, so. And you want to move on to 11 uh, B? Okay, done with that? Yeah. yeah. All right. Move on to 11B. And the leak detection Let's report see. on the leak. There may be no public comment, but I recommend checking. Oh, ab about, does somebody out there want one of us to be? The risk detection, whatever it is. No, for the risk management, risk management in Sacramento. Okay. No, okay. So, so that's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. You have to keep me on the straight now. So the leak detection B is the next one. Yeah, the uh, director of operations here to give you a report on uh, the, the final leak detection. I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Furtado. Uh, this memo is for the. Board of Directors to accept, accept the final report for leak detection project at the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, we conducted in October and November of 2018 two week blocks of time to do the leak detection project with Utility Services Associates out of Seattle, Washington. Um, we were able to get 100 plus or minus miles of pipe done. <coughs> Um, it was broken down into two phases, which was a survey phase where we went out and correlated to listen for noises on the pipes and meters and hydrants and everything else. And then after we detected the noises and everything, we went back and it's a pinpointing phase where they do a correlation and it tells you exactly or close to exactly where the leak is on the pipe. Um, after pinpointing district staff returned and facilitated repairs, it has been found that the gallons per minute were estimated a little higher than actually measured, measured on most of the leaks. And the number of leaks was slightly lower, which is understandable. Some of the noise and stuff comes from um, water being used at the time of leak detection. And they will pick that up as a leak in the system and we go back 
and there's no noise at that time and there's no leak where it's been dug up. Um, at this time, 32 of the 40 leaks have been repaired. The major ones have been repaired. The ones that are still going are some smaller ones. And we do have many leaks that still get called in that we have to respond to that are more of a priority than these last few that we have. Um, it was estimated at 128 gallons a minute is what was coming from these leaks. Thus far out of the 32 leaks, it's been determined at right around 63 gallons a minute for the ones that have been repaired, which has the potential of 30, Two million gallons of water a year, <laughs> which breaks down to two million, two point seven million gallons a month, and eighty nine thousand gallons per day. Um, this equals to about four point seven two percent of the water produced in two thousand eighteen by the district in whole. Um, and the district, it cost the district right, right around $25,000 to do this leak detection. And it is recommended by the state that we do it every three to five years. Any questions? And you. So, how many gallons a year do we produce? About. In 2018, we produced almost 700 million gallons. So basically it looked like the 32 million was just under what we sold last month. Mm -hmm. Yes, roughly. I think it was 37. It's pretty close. Yes. Like so basically, and how many miles of pipe in the, or how many miles of pipe in the system total? Uh, about 190 miles of pipe. Okay. And that includes the intakes, other, the other things, and then uh, the main line, above ground, main above line ground stuff like that. that was not really detected. Is there any reason why we wouldn't want to do, I mean, given, I mean, this is significant. This is a huge amount of water that yeah. actually would, would, eat, would directly benefit the aquifer during the summer months if the leaks were going on. I mean, that is a, I mean, you talk about an ASR, that is an ASR that we yeah. would actually have to pull out. Um, why would we not do the other rest of the system next year? Uh, there's no reason why we wouldn't. A lot of the pipeline that wasn't done, which is miles and miles of pipe, which is above ground, that we inspect with our own crews going into intakes and going into okay. above ground facilities that we have. And so it's inspected, so and those are going to be visible. The majority of the leaks found in this leak detection process are leaks that are not surfacing, period. Right, understand. So the 90 miles we didn't survey, that's all above ground? Not all, but the majority. So, valves, are, are these numbers, uh, 831 valves were leaking, or is no, that we're just... No, were detected, were listened to. So they went out there and listened to, oh, oh, okay. that's how many valves they went and listened to, then, that, then the other number is how many services they went and listened to, how many meters they went and listened to. All right, so, like hydrants, did you find hydrants were leaking? We did have a few. Okay. And it'll be on the run of the hydrant or at the bottom of the hydrant, not the actual. Okay. There are some that drip from the. Keep in mind, most of these were yeah. underground subsurface where you couldn't see. Right. And there's, no, there's no. equal amount of leaks that we repair above ground, I mean, okay. that we get calls in. So this is just a partial number of our actual uh, uh, water leaks. loss through <laughs> leaks and per one, year. One last question Did we uh, geocode uh, the leaks? And are we putting that into a heat map for. Uh, or our GIS system is not there yet to do so. We're getting there. Okay. So we did put them on the board here. So all the pink ones were from the four years ago when we did leak detection the first time. The new purple ones that are on the board now are the ones that were found this year. So it is being kept as a record and it will be being put into the GIS. Both reports will be put into the GIS mapping once the GIS is to that point. Do we keep a similar thing like this for the leaks that you do the above ground that you detect that happen? What, what I'm looking there for is an Excel spreadsheet of all those that can, will be put on a heat map once the GIS system is to that point. So you know where I'm going. Yes. I mean, for example, I look I up there. And I can see that area right there is in serious need of pipe replacement. Correct. Right. 
So with being able to put all the leaks on a heat map, we can basically be targeting where to send the pipe crew that we yeah. want to get spun up. And, and basically it's all the four inch, all the four inch and, and smaller. It's the original yeah. system that's you know well, close to over 100 years but old. There's a lot of it that's a yeah. six inch AC too though. Yeah, I mean, we have so too, much AC pipe that. in our system and it's not good fine. But anyway, that's, I mean, you know where I want to go. No, I totally yeah. understand. 100%. We're with you on that 100%. Yeah. So, Bill? Oh, well, yeah, like I said, it's 5%, a lot of water, and I wish this technology was back, you know, when I was installing leaking pipelines to find, and, um, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, and it's, it's just, it's, oh my gosh, it's my, and this is a good example of, um, because, yeah, those leaky pipelines, that's what they're doing. They're performing ASR. They're basically leaking water back into the water, that into is, the groundwater basin. That's very and that's true, my that's water that point cost, about that why ASR is, is for the yeah. birds. You know, it's, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time to have potable, to treat and have potable water and put it back into the ground through leaks. And now we want to, now we actually want to build wells to do the same exact thing. Makes no sense. The, uh, the report that was done, or these, the leak detection that was done four years ago, how does that compare to this current one? At that time, it was 10% of the water produced that year. Is what oh, we found. A lot more. Yeah, so it, oh. we, it's been cut in half. But keep in mind, too, that was the first time right. we did uh, the right. subsurface leak detection um, years back, and this is our second time. Good so good. it was a substantial amount of subsurface leaks back then that we knew that we had just from our you know, a monthly accounting. That was our first time and it proved to be, you know, I think it's like a hundred and something, hundred and fifteen gallons per minute or better. Yeah, it was, it was over a hundred. It was yeah. over a hundred leaks the first time. Was yeah. So the gallons. ninety miles of pipe remaining, if you were to remove the stuff that's above ground that you currently can monitor yourself, how many miles of pipe is left underground that might be leaking or could benefit by having another leak test done sooner? rather than four or five years from now. I'd have to look further into that to get you that number. Okay. But it was all mapped out and highlighted on a map that what they did, so I'd come up with the rest of it. Well, okay. terms of leak detection for uh, ASR. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it is a, you know, grant, grant you own account for water, or water leaking is a, is a great expense to the district, yeah. you know, in all aspects, there's no doubt about it. And this is a substantial time it takes, so once, we do get up on these leak crews and we do start replacing the pipe. Well, there's some substantial savings. Well, this is a huge argument. Not just in yeah. the construction costs, yeah. but in leaky water, leak yeah. detection, and all the different aspects that go with it. Cost of chemicals, yeah. pumping. Um, is, is there anything higher ROI than this? I can't imagine. It's, it's big. It's pretty high. It's, it's big. Education grants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Sorry. <laughs> I had to. I'm driving a red car. We had a house earlier for it. There are so many things to do for this district. Uh, so, anybody in the audience want to come? Uh, Lou? Yeah, I have some questions. The 32 out of the 40 repaired leaks that you talked about, what about those eight that weren't repaired? Are they in process of being repaired? Or can you not repair them? What's the status of those eight? They're on a priority list right now. So they can be repaired, they're just a, a bigger project? No, they're or, not a bigger project. There's leaks ahead of them that are more substantial. Schedule that, come in, that come in from calls from the public or are turned in by other ways. Right. So eventually we'll be able to fix all 40 of those leaks? Right. Okay. Yes. Next question is, how many of those leaks were leaks before? Do we know? I mean, have, are we fixing leaks upon leaks? Or are those all new leaks? Um, I suspect we're fixing so, some leaks on leaks. Well, I have no data. Valves, yes, because there's valves that we have to go back to and tighten packings and things like that that are in this report. And yes, we've been doing more than once a valve like that. Because that, that would seem to be at a higher priority for getting fixed so, so that you don't have to keep going back and fixing every time you do the, the leaks. Lot, like Rick said, a lot of this area that we do have these leaks yeah. is the old four inch and two inch piping that needs replacement. Which is Boulder Creek? Yeah, Correct. a lot of it are Boulder yeah. Creek. I mean, all the red dotted line on this map is all two inch pipe. Um, wow. I mean, it just screams out at you. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh. And then, <laughs> it, the last question is, how much of the work we're planning on doing in the $10 million uh, loan that we're going to get to do infrastructure is going to address these areas? A lot of it. A lot of it? Lot Good. Of it. Uh, and Mr. Ferris, when you dig down, a lot of times when they dig down, there will be a patch side by side of another leak. Yeah, and then you'll, yeah, after about the fourth or fifth patch, they'll cut a section of Maine out. Um, and that's most of the two inch. But I, I would say, James, do you have a rough idea when you have about time frame you'll have those other leaks fixed? A month? Yeah, we're figuring within the next I mean, month. It usually starts to slow down yeah. you know, once the rain stops dropping. You know? We've got some other scheduled activities such as flushing and so forth that we have to rotate to and that. But it's not like they're going to be out there for years. Right. Last question is uh, if you were to replace all the piping in the area where most of the leaks are concentrated, how many miles of piping are you talking about? Hmm. Roughly. You don't have those You're yeah. going to find out. Yeah. <laughs> this is great stuff. Though. Yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Absolutely fantastic. Any other comments? Uh, the crews did uh, just an excellent job. Um, some of this work, because of it's very noise sensitive, that has to be done at night. You know, Highway 9, Felton, uh, the, the major intersection, they were out there in the middle of the night. They had to do night work because the traffic is just too heavy to, uh, to, to, to to listen. So there was quite a bit of night work this time. And that was a section that we didn't get to do the last time. Yeah. Because of the, we didn't have a setup. That's and you we, didn't get run over. Nobody got run over. Uh, there was a lot of night work this time to catch some of the stuff that we didn't do last time. Good job for your crew. Yeah, they did a, they did a fantastic job out there. And, very time consuming when they're doing it. Was this district staff that did it? Uh, district staff was involved. Two district staff was involved with the <coughs> crew. Oh, okay. You know, for flying so, and right. pointing out facilities and whatever it was yeah. out there. Okay. Awesome. And what percentage of the t entire di district did you do? Mm, just about 60%. Right. 60%. Okay. I'd like to move that we uh, approve the San Lorenzo Valley Leak Detection final report. Second. Just. That's all that uh, really that, needs to be done, right? Is it just. Yeah, that's it. Just receive it. Just, just receive it. Just receive it. Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Just yeah. Voice for it. yeah. No action. Yeah, just receive it. I let you talk this time, John. Pardon? I let you talk. You this. did, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Don't bust my chops next no. time. <laughs> it's a pleasure working with you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, okay. For clarification, I heard a motion and a second to approve the report. I think the recommendation is accepted. But I didn't oh, well, I guess we don't have to vote on it, or is that what you said? Just accept it. Yeah, just accept it, isn't it? Just no, consensus no, or right. something? We, let, let's be consistent here, because in the last report we did accept it. Well, so. we just vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Director Swan? Yes. Director Poles? Yes. Director Smallman? Yes. <coughs> President Henry? Yes. Okay. I want to get to this one. Uh, bids for Long Pico pressure relief valves. Wow, are those up in price. Okay. Um, Let's see, on June, as you all know, on, on June 1st, the district consolidated with the Lump Pico County Water District uh, as part of the consolidation, except uh, assessment districts. 16-01 was formed providing funding for water system improvements, including replacing eight uh, pressure reducing valve stations at various uh, locations uh, out in the Lumpico water system. Plans and specifications were um, prepared. The district went to bid, a formal bidding, uh, and received uh, three bids. Uh, Earthworks at 468,000, Monterey Peninsula Engineering at 621,000, and the Don Chapin uh, company of 780,000. Earthworks obviously was low bid at uh, 468,000. Uh, Some things I'd like to point out is that the final engineering uh, report and assessment for the assessment district 16-01 and the merger with Lumpico, uh, we had eight valves. So um, on their mapping, they, there is eight PRV valves um, for replacement listed. Uh, at a cost of $308,000 um, each. And after field review uh, in the distribution system, it was determined that only six PRV stations needed replacement. We changed some of the operations around up in that system, and we alleviated one of the valves because we, um, we removed the zone, the upper 
Lewis zone, uh, and one of the other valves did not require to be replaced. Um, so the six PRV valves came in at 52% higher than the eight estimate. And that's kind of the point that construction costs are escalating considerably. Um, in some ways, it's, it's a good thing we had those two extra valves in there because it did give us a little extra money. Uh, we see this steep uh, rise in construction costs. We did have three available bidders, um, which is better than it has been in the past. Um, staff is uh, recommending uh, that you award, uh, that the board adopt the ATAP resolution, rewarding the bid for replacement of the pressure reducing valves in Lumpico to Earthworks Drilling for uh, $468,000. And are more than happy to take questions. Bill? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I, mean, I know that there was nine, actually nine on the original plans, but anyway, yeah, the, anyway, it's, just it's, this, Real Needs simple. to be replaced or six. Do we have to, is six going to take care of the thing? Yes. And we don't have to do a thing? Yes. Yeah. Right. And then uh, I guess the other only comment is this, I, I really, really, really think, I mean, that's an easy job that I think that we can do in, you know, staff and say. Yeah, we had the staff. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we need to build to start doing these types of jobs. And you know maybe other types like small pipeline workers and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean these guys are marking these jobs up like yeah. nobody's. But even this four sixty eight is, I think we could do it. You know, boy, I don't, I don't want. Yeah, well, to, yeah. I, I wasn't sure how much some the actual material. There are a were. prefab vault. Yeah. You know, that you buy through clay valves. So you know, it's not like there's. Those were each yeah. Yeah. I do not have seven thousand. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, this. It's probably in today's climate, but just saying, man, we can save a lot of money. And, the reason, and before, last comment, um, you know, I've, I've been pushing to do these PRVs before and saying, hey, let's get these done because we had the funding before. And because we, we were saving money by not having those service line blocks. And people were looking at me going, you know, well, uh, you know, I don't think, I, you know, we're going to save a lot of money getting these done because you've seen the crews out there doing emergency repairs, wastes water, a lot of money. I'm just saying, I mean, there's these little subtle, subtle costs of money that we can save. Let's focus on those and let's not focus on these education grants and mint and stuff like that. Uh, Bob? Okay, I'll say you're right. So, um, was Don Chapin the company that's doing that little job that we yeah. approved uh, last time? So we kind of know where their pricing comes in at. They're right? usually lower. Well, they haven't been the last two. I mean, oh, oh, not Don Chapin, sorry, not Don Chapin, uh, Earthworks. Earthworks is usually no, lower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Don Chapin, we kind of know, he's at, a, he's at like a 2.5x over what yeah. we would expect, right? Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, Earthworks looks like they're in Capitola. Do we know if anybody on this crew is going to be is from San Lorenzo Valley? I do not. Okay, so again, we're sending all of our money out of the economy, local economy here. It's a little closer this time. It's a little closer, but it's <laughs> not close enough. Um, but we got to do it, and the only thing I would say is Ladock is going to have to, at some point in time, address the fact that unless we get some good news on future bids, there's not enough money in the assessment district to cover all the projects that we're. Um, do have you, um, what are the reviews on this company? Did, have you looked into that? Check it out. Well, we, you know, they're a licensed contractor. We've worked with them before. Other people have worked with them before. It's hit and miss. It's like any contractor. It's as good as you stay on top of them as your inspector, and as you, you know, you start out with them being. Um, you know, on top of the project and you make sure that they understand that and make sure that there's no cost cutting and they have to provide it per per bit. Mm -hmm. But every contractor, you know, some are better than others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, so he's like middle of the road. Or... You have a nice website. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really want to say anything okay. about okay. another contract. They're an acceptable contractor and, mm -hmm. and there's no reason why that I know of that we should not award bid. Or we could exclude that a little bit. That's a process in itself to uh, exclude a little bit. And I have to say, Mr. Um, Fultz, that I take exception to your comment. We um, this has been going on 
what, for two, wait, it's been over two years now, hasn't it? That, yeah, it's that, almost three years. Yes, and we built in a loan they, that they could have used the interest for the loan. So let me tell well, you, right in the very beginning, let's let's let me just see. say that we were told that if they did not get all the work done with the, this amount of money, and it was a high, they built in extra money, then, then it would be the responsibility of all of San Lorenzo Valley to pay the rest. We just want to be safe. We want our water to be safe. Believe it or not, I'm actually on your side in this. I'm yeah. merely raising it as this is something that people need to start talking about because it's going to be an issue. Well, I'm saying that the, Roger Rogers and I have had. I, I, well, I'm not saying that the. Well, I'm not saying Juan Pico is mm -hmm. paying more for this. Right. I'm right. saying this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And that's what I how I took it right. from Bob that we need to get this back in front of the. Okay. That there's going to be some discussion mm -hmm. about what projects we can move forward. How to. And how to afford and pay and prioritize the mm -hmm. projects. That's how I took and it. And how to okay. and how yeah. it's going, we're going to fulfill the obligation that we have to want people to finish yeah. all the projects. There's, okay. going, there's going to be a lot all of the other. Uh, projects. There's, yeah. going to, there's going to be a lot of other switches and changes where I think we can save a lot of money on, on Lone Pico. They look, we're going all the way off topic here, but in the okay. future, but yeah. there's been a lot of different changes. But that's okay. that's another okay. discussion. Thank you for moving it forward. Thank yeah. you. For okay, Debbie. Time. Yeah, just shortly, um, Tony and I have made ourselves really a nuisance to uh, the old board mm -hmm. <laughs> about bringing this up, and we are now working on. Um, we are both on the the Long Beach Oversight Committee, and we do have to explain to people that perhaps not all the work is going to be done, and we need to be able to. I would, I would like the board support to say, and it is not going to fall on Long Pico because the board is going to take responsibility for past decisions. These were not done in a timely manner. They did not use interest rates that were below 2% when this was presented. And all of these costs were heavily padded and accepted by everyone. It was this district that did not move on it. And that should be made clear to everyone that Long Pico is not imposing a burden. The burden was imposed by a previous board decision. Okay, we're getting off agenda here. So, that, so uh, it's about... Uh, awarding this bid. Right. So we need to do that. Okay. We've okay. I like to make a motion. <laughs> okay, you can make a motion. I make a motion that we approve the award for bid <laughs> for Earthworks Paving Contractors in the amount of 468. Can I suggest an amendment? Okay. That we approve resolution number 28, 18-19, awarded construction contract for Long Pico for the replacement project. Okay. That's um, mm -hmm. fine. So I'll move. second. Your second, your amendment. Yeah. Well, I suggest well, I just, he, he accepted mm -hmm. my changes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Words, but I'll, he's seconding that. Okay. All righty. So, Holly. Director Swan. Yes. Director Pulse. Yes. Director Smallman. Aye. President Henry. Yes. Um, wow, we're getting through this. So Valley Gardens is off the agenda. So it, it, I'll let our illustrious attorney speak to us now, if she wishes to. Well, I, I think it's uh, on the agenda um, to talk about documents provided to the board in closed session. Um, so. It, as I'm sure you all know, the Brown Act requires that if a document goes to a majority of the board um, pertaining to an item on the agenda, it must be made available to the public. That rule applies to open session meetings and not to closed session meetings. Typically, um, this district, as well as most public agencies, complies with that rule to make documents relevant to open session agenda items available to the public either in the board packet or if they come late at the meeting or certainly upon request of a member of the public. We don't apply that rule with respect to closed session items. That's consistent with the law, it's consistent with the Brown Act, it's consistent with the Public Records Act. That said, I understand that, that there are concerns about transparency and desire to be more transparent. And so I would make the recommendation, the board is always, it's always at the board's discretion to 
you know, waive privileges to release information to the public that it could otherwise keep confidential. My recommendation is if you wish to do something like that in this instance, that you do it on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, the concern that I heard, and I should backtrack a little, the concern that I heard had not to do with attorney-client privilege memos that get given to the board in closed session, but it's otherwise public documents that are relevant to a closed session item that may be provided to the board in connection with a closed session item. Those materials are otherwise public, however, we don't make them public by virtue of them being provided to the board in closed session. If the board wants to make those materials available to the public, it can, but I recommend doing that on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, if I bring something that's otherwise a public document to you for consideration in closed session, I would recommend that during that closed session the board consider whether it wishes to make that document available to the public after the meeting, and then we can do that. I would counsel against adopting a policy of always providing those kinds of materials to the public, in part because it's very hard to foresee, sitting here right now, what sort of circumstances may arise in the future. So um, if you, if you want to be more transparent and provide quote, otherwise public closed session materials to, um, to the public, uh, I recommend doing so on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you're um, talking about things that are readily available to the district, like you can go down to the county and look at lawsuits and, and get information. So that's something anybody can look at if they want to take the time. It's, that's the kind of stuff you're talking about. Yeah, that's that's kind of stuff. Like, for example, if a, if a motion gets filed in a litigation that we're talking about in closed session, I may provide a copy of that motion to the board so that it can review that document and have an intelligent conversation about what's going on in the litigation. That document is public in the sense that, yeah, somebody could go get it from the court file. Yeah. Um, however, we do not make it available to the public at the meeting simply because the board looked at it in closed session. But the board could choose to provide a copy of that. To the okay. Public, which Bob? Yeah, just to, to be clear, I was the one that had raised the question about this because um, something that is otherwise publicly available, um, it seemed odd that it would be disclosed at some point. Um, even if it's relating to a lawsuit, everybody's going to know that we're certainly looking at motions that are being filed by the people that we're involved with in, in the lawsuit. But the only question I had about that, is there any copyright restrictions or anything like that? I know that the courts sometimes charge for um, release of information. I don't know if it's up to us to release it to the public but, so it can be downloaded, for example, off our website or something like that. Do you know? It's, it's hard for me to imagine a situation where copyright would prevent you from releasing um, this kind of information. Right, so, I mean, in general, my view is that if something's publicly available for another source, um, it should be released as part of our um, uh, packet, but I can, I can accept a recommendation that we do that post as opposed to pre, and that's fine. Okay, and if it's helpful, just imagine the circumstance where there's a sensitive personnel matter and there might be, you know, things that are posted online or something that are relevant and it may not be and I've never it may not be a good idea to just as a matter of course hand those out to the public just that's yeah. Yeah. That's, that's okay. <coughs> any other question about that public <laughs> oh, you long pecans, you're so much trouble. Uh, just, I, I think that would be great because most people are really interested in what's going on, like with the Viera issue, for example. So that um, I think the public would appreciate that. And wouldn't it be that they're charging you just because of having to produce that report and get that's the only thing they're charging for? That's the other thing. Any other comments? Is there any no. Music no. No, that was just information. So, uh, the strategic plan review, um, 
H. We aren't going to really review the plan tonight. It's kind of do we want a facilitator to help us with the plan because most people or not people, organizations, when it comes to strategic plans, get a facilitator to ha help them with it because it's rather involved. Um, so that kind of is the question here. And I have a, a short staff report, if I may. Yes. Um, you know, the strategic, the strategic plan does serve as a framework and a basis for decision making on detailed planning over an extended period of time. As a top-level planning document, strategic plan uh, uh, confirms the overall mission for an organization, affirms the vision by looking uh, out into the future, assesses core values and how the organization will do business, and creates a roadmap of actions and activities uh, to best position uh, for continued mission success. The strategic, our strategic, current strategic plan has not been reviewed since approved and, re, and review updated is recommended. The majority of the, the board members have changed since the plan was adopted in 2016, or 2016. The Lampico Consolidation and the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency are not included in the plan. Uh, progress has been made in some areas of the existing plan, including the north-south inner tie. I reached out to the same consultant that started, the, uh, we're on our second strategic plan, the first original plan, then there was one update when uh, Manager Lee came to work for the district, and we're at almost, I think, five years again, or four years again, um, to look at it. And I talked to the same consultant, which is BMI management consultant, Brent Ides, is uh, a long time educator and um, Mayor Tracy, uh, ex-Mayor Tracy, who does board planning and board orientations and, and has a really good background and understanding. Um, I asked for a proposal to update our existing uh, strategic plan and, uh, you know, the consultant would first conduct interviews with all, with all board members and general manager staff to determine the status of the strategic plan and how now exists and assess uh, what may need to be changed to better reflect the status of the district today. Uh, interviews would be conducted with each of us for roughly around 60 minutes. And the uh, consultant would uh, facilitate a workshop session with the board and public to review inputs gathered above and determine how to best to move forward. Any changes in the strategic plan, um, it's anticipated the workshop would be three to four hours depending on board discussion. And then the consultant would provide a brief written follow-up um, and update of the, of the strategic plan. Um, that uh, comes in at a record or an estimated cost at a roughly $88,000, uh, $9,000 to have that done by a consultant. The, I think the strategic plan is critical for our organization. It just helps staff move ahead. It gets everybody on the same page, the committees, uh, the board. Uh, it helps long-range planning on what we're doing. Well, I think I think it's really important that we have an updated strategic plan. Now, whether we do it through this consultant or another consultant, or do it and try to do it in house, which I would not recommend. I think it's an important document that we when we uh, move forward with. So it's 88, 88,000? Yeah, eighty-eight hundred. Eighty-eight to, to update it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Drop that zero. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 8,800. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Well, let's see. I just, uh, price cut. Just say 80,000. I'm a little unclear as to what the deliverable is. Is he going to deliver an updated strategic plan? Yes, based on, he'll facilitate all of us coming together. And, and Who's going to take the pen and write it and finish it? He is. Yes. Brent Ives is. Okay. Right. Um, you know, the framework's already laid out from, from mm -hmm. previous that you may want to change that. I don't know. Um, and this will be shaped with what, what this board's vision is the next four to five years. Um, and it, it's a really a good working tool for all of us because then we can set schedules and, and try to, because there's schedules in the strategic plan, then we can get, uh, schedule meetings and start talking about how our planning is going to go to achieve those goals. And also, if we try to do this ourselves, it'd take us months. Well, let's it'd get to have be, a facilitator. Be, 
It, yeah, no, I'm just saying, yeah. it, it, if we try to do it, it'd kind of be like the the board policy thing that went on for months and months and months. And we need this. We need this to direct uh, committees yeah. and for the board to know where we're going. And that we'd all be interviewed. You all have good ideas, and we need to get all this into a document, and that the board, agree, and not just a single idea. Each one of you has great single ideas, and then we need to get the board to approve and then direct staff. So, Rick, you felt that the 2016, when you did it in 2016, it was, it was very helpful to that. It was a good process. We, uh, Maybe you can improve it. And then you know, it. there's a lot of public. You know, public input is important with these, because um, you're, you know, you're shaping the district. Um, the first one, the original one, was really good because we never had one before, and it was, I think we went out and about. What year was that? Yeah. Uh, 2013? 14. 14, somewhere in there. Um, and that, then we've, you know, we've grown each, uh, the next time, and, uh, you know, I think it would be a good process for the board to get through. And then, you know, we get a, all of your ideas get down, we, the board reviews those ideas, and then as a board, you, we move forward. Yes. Instead of as a single individual. And I've been involved in these before for credit union, and we always had a facilitator. It's just right. a way to go. I mean, I've been working on a committee by committee, department by department list of what I think the priorities yeah. are for the for the district, and I, I'm I'm sort of torn between the fact that I think. Some of that could be done, some of those discussions about priorities could be done by the board without a facilitator. Um, I, I really want to go back and now that I have this information, take a look at the strategic plan again and see if we're really talking about changing what I call the strategic objectives and overview versus the specific tactics and tasks that we're going to undertake. If it's more the former, I could see more value in the facilitator. If it's more the latter, I don't see as much value in it. Well, so, no, most of these are usually, um, they, they have a lot of components to them. They're like what we've done, what we want to do, where we want to go. I mean, there's just a lot of parts to this. And you'll start with the mission statement, and then we'll build off of that. Yeah. And the mission statement may be fine as is. I'm not advocating changing the mission statement, but um, you know we have a, a change in the majority of the board. I'd like to add that there is, uh, like Rick said, Long Pico's not in there. Long Pico, a Sigma There's is a huge. That are not in there right now. Yeah. 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 You know what? What's the direction of the district going with Sigma? And there's just a, you know I, things are changing. By the way, not not saying we don't update the plan. Right. Right. Talking about the method by which we do and how much money we spend. Yeah, I understand. Um, you know, what the what Everett Dirksen, you know, a million here, a million there, pretty uh, soon it's real money. No, I. It is real money, yes. I, well, I think there is a, a good return on the investment, Bob. Because I, yeah. I think we'll move at a, at a quicker speed, we'll get it, I think we'll, we'll get a, an end document quicker, and we'll move ahead. It's just like six thousand dollars is real money. It's a dollar. <laughs> so, I, 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 I'm, we're not taking any action tonight on it. Uh, you don't have to, because I the proposal came in late today. I, I haven't got the proposal to you, so I would no. feel better that, um, and I don't want to. Um, we kind of learned on uh, uh, our watershed department, uh, environmental department, not to put too much on that first meeting agenda when we have. Workshop. A workshop. So uh, I would probably say I want to bring this to you the second meeting in March. The okay. uh, yeah, same item we're... with the contract for you to review. And we're going to have finance next. Yeah, because you're going to have a finance workshop. And I, you know, I think we had too much on the last first meeting and it, yeah. it caused delays. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you had something you wanted to say? Yes, I think having a facilitator would better allow um, uh, public input and, and uh, participation in the process of strategic plan review, which is something that I think Rick um, had mentioned uh, was valuable in previous iterations of this. 
-hmm. Sometimes things flow better with, you know, they do flow better with a facilitator to take the lead and work the room and yeah. the different personalities and Brent's got excellent um, experience on doing that. I've sat through many of his conferences. And but we need to be prepared because I remember when he came to present something about the board policy manual and and it was it, 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 it was like waste of time yeah. and he then he said he said to me I get a feeling there's some issues here because <laughs> I've known him for quite a while yeah. and we discussed that today yeah so no um, but I think if we're prepared it, because the 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 board policy thing really hadn't been worked out and he came and then a one director that was involved she wasn't there and it, it was just chaos well in that, in that particular case I, to be fair to them um, yeah. it was because the committee had two fundamentally opposing visions yep uh, that is no longer the case in terms of the majority and so we're, you know here we are Okay, but we're not going to decide tonight. No, we can bring it back. Uh, I'll bring it back. So I, the, I got the contract late today, so second I'll bring it back. Uh, yeah, the second meeting okay. in March. Uh, just out of curiosity, is, is there anyone else that could do this? That's sort of well, they probably could. It's just I thought, you know, and without going out, there probably is. But I thought we'd get a better price because he's done it before for us, and it's updating sure. his own work. I mean, it doesn't did necessarily. He, did he do the last one? Then? Yes. Yes, he did the last one, and uh, you know, I I could check around and ask other agencies, um, you know, that we would typically, if that was the case, put out an RFP and have people come in and, and talk. Well, for Which, it's not worth it. But, um, you know, I think he does a good job and he understands this district. He understands the interaction with public and board members and the players and I think it's a value in keeping him. Just my opinion. Oh, he's worked with most of you, or at least two of you, three of you, maybe. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, uh, Question? Yes. The $8,800 that you were talking about, Rick, that is a update on the strategic plan that was done in 2016, correct? It's yeah. going to be a whole new plan. Well, yeah. But, but the, the quote is one that we've used before, and it was the last one that was done. Yes, correct. What about the one in 2014? Was that vastly different in your mind between the one done in 14 and the one done in 16? I mean, no. are we basically throwing out the one in 14 now? No, I think, but, well, the one we did, the last one we did built off of that one, I think it's the same format. Okay, so we're, we're just building going one. down the road. Yeah, we're changing things around. Yeah. Okay, any other comment? Okay. So, can we uh, move on to minutes and approve the minutes? Is this on the consent agenda? Or is it, it is on the consent agenda, the minutes, for January 23rd and February 7th. I got a comment on the minutes for the um, Brown Act. Um, I noted that I was there, <clears> and it doesn't say that I attended that meeting, so I want to get credit for attending that thing. Um, may sure. I say yeah. what happened? You weren't there when the meeting began. You came mm -hmm. in after we had already declared the meeting to be a community meeting and therefore wasn't an actual um, board meeting any longer. Uh, legal clarification. Yeah. In order to have this discussion, we need to pull that set of minutes from the consent yeah. yeah. uh, 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 I Could I ask you well, something, yeah. though, is if it started off that it wasn't a real meeting because there weren't three directors there when the third one showed up. To, at that point, did it become a, a board meeting or just still just a... Uh, I, I guess I'm, the meeting shouldn't have been um, convened until a third board member. It, it, it wasn't convened. It was turned into a community meeting. Yeah, community it meeting. It, it was never convened as a board meeting, in other words. Right. First of all, let's pull. I want to pull this item from the uh, consent agenda. Sorry. About okay. Uh, so we can talk about it. Okay. 
Okay, this is the February 7th? No, no the, January the January 23rd. It, it was uh, Dennis Tinney from okay. SDRMA came and talked oh, about the Brown Act. Well, can we just note that I was, um, the tenant was there, I came five minutes late, and, and I was there, just participating. Well, we waited a while. We waited. Well, we waited. Well, we waited. Well, we waited. So the question well, yeah. here is, was it a, I guess I'm confused what the question is. He just wants credit for being there. Because I just want credit. I don't want there. somebody coming back at me and say, hey, you didn't take your vote. I, I, I don't have a problem with yeah. saying you came in at a particular time. I think that's, that's fair, yeah. but... The question is, I think, can we still run it as a community meeting? Because that's the way we can find it. It was not run as a board meeting. We did not take any action. We simply got a presentation on the, the Brown Act. And that was something that we wanted to do not only for the board, but for the committee members that did show up. And there were some that did. And, and that I, was it. I, I, talked, I spoke to Dennis Timoney, who gave the Brown Act presentation about this, how do we handle this, because we were waiting, waiting, and, and no one was showing up, so we only had two board members there, and he said, well, we can go ahead with it, it's just a community meeting. Okay, I, I mean, I'm not hearing anything that gives me any concern about Brown Act compliance. <laughs> no, I don't think there's an issue. Yeah. Can, can we go ahead and We didn't make any decisions. We were just a training. But can we go ahead and say that as well? I just want knowledge that I want to tell you. It's a training. I was no more than five or ten minutes late. Yeah, we were 15 minutes late. Yeah, we were quite late. 15. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see why not. Yeah, okay. I'm fine with that. We'll just put it in there that he showed up at such a time. But then it would be a board meeting. It's called a special board meeting. It's called a special board meeting. But in the minutes it says it was changed to a community meeting. Wouldn't the title have to change as well? So this is where you get to earn your <laughs> yeah. money. Shall we wait until the next meeting to vote on these minutes? Uh, We're just okay. So. You arrived five minutes late. We put that in the meeting. This was convened as a community in meeting instead of a board meeting. There's nothing that you would have needed to do that I'm aware of. Correct. No decisions made. It would any. have to be different. So I, I don't see any harm in um, calling the meeting and saying you were five minutes late. Right. Um, and put that in the minutes. Yeah. Fifteen. What was saying? Call it a meeting. You mean call it a board meeting? Because we never went back and convened it as an official board meeting. And from that, we did not run it as an official board meeting. We ran it as a community meeting. But if my name's not in there, somebody could come back to me and say, "Hey, you didn't take your well, vote." I, I, I get that. But I'm, so. That's what I'm saying. Do you, do you, we need more time to be able to decide this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you bring it back at the next. Meeting. Okay. okay. Sounds like a plan to me. You. you guys got it? Yeah. So we're going to, so we can approve um, B minutes unless somebody has any questions or deletions or whatever. I make a motion to approve B minutes. <clears throat> Second. Director Swan? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Director Smallman? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Okay. District reports. Department status reports and Getting late. I know. I have for the rest of the staff. I have one update as part of my report process. As you recall, the last board meeting, I do believe, or one of the last board meetings, we talked about a joint retreat with uh, Scotts Valley, and if the district was interested in, in having a joint retreat, and one of the the joint retreat was at 
was uh, an eight hour, I do believe, an eight hour day, and it was a long day, and it was during the week, and I do believe the direction that I uh, received from the board to, to go back to Scotts Valley is we'd like it to be only a couple hours, and uh, possibly on a Saturday, maybe a dinner. Um, Scotts Valley still is proposing to do uh, an all day retreat during the week. Is there any interest from the, any of the board? All day on the weekend? Yeah, all day during the week. During the week? Yeah. Uh, I'd prefer to have it on the weekend. I don't think it's going to, I don't think uh, you're going to meet those. I think that's already been relayed to them. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, did they give you any indication why? I mean, it's not that we couldn't have one. This is the group team thing, right? Is the group team. You know, they're, bringing, they're bringing a facilitator in. There's a lot of information that they want to, and it's a bonding with, Scotts Valley directors. That kind of means it'd be only me who could go. I can, yeah. I can, I can bond over a single. I, 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 I understand. Um, I just, you know, I, I can t tell Scotts Valley that hey, you know, and I've already told her that our directors have issues during the week um, due to employment. Um, I mean, I can't obviously ask for it because they won't pay and, my daily rate. And, they, and they're pr proposing the date is, uh, they've settled on Wednesday, March 27th. Um, okay. I'm not interested. Okay. No, that's all, I'm, that's all I'm asking. I'm interested in meeting with them, but not that particular. And not for that length of time. Okay. Good enough. And I get to meet with them so much already. <laughs> that was one thing I had, and I don't know if staff, uh, as you see, the finance director, uh, she has family in town, couldn't make it tonight, um, but there is a highlight on her page one uh, that the USDA loan, uh, we did receive the, for the formal letter of conditions for the USDA loan, uh, so officially allocates the $8.8 .8 million funding uh, for the listings of projects. It's a nice little tidbit. So now we're moving ahead on design. <coughs> Not only a nice little tip, but that's huge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is true. And if the other department, uh, environmental, or the director of operations, would like to point I'd anything like to out. Point out that in my report there is 17 leaks that were fixed during the month of January, and that's not including the work orders that were not closed before the end of the month. So there was. A few more that were actually done during that month, but it's just a figure to show how many leaks we are fixing a month, and it does keep us very busy. And that's on top of the other projects and other stuff that we have to keep running and doing. How do you find the leaks when it's raining? Uh, well, you'd be surprised at how many get called in when it's raining, where it'll just be bubbling up, making muddy water instead of clear water. And when it's leaking in the road, a lot of people, you know, people notice that kind of thing. People are definitely on the lookout for that that kind of stuff in their neighborhoods, and so the majority of them get called in very quickly if they're surfacing, even if it's raining. Sure. It'll start pumping sand, so dirty water going down the road instead of clear water during a rainstorm is a red flag. Or we lost storage. Yeah. And that was the result of the oil notice that we sent out to the board. Yeah. I've seen it again. Yeah. And we lose storage. Well, that's a, that's a lot of work. Yeah, we need why, those guys. Why are, all forty aren't fixed yet? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's get let's get pipe replaced and then we don't have to fix as many. Yeah, agree. yeah. Nope. I agree. These guys do so much work for yeah. us. Okay. So, then there was environmental report or Any nothing. Is yeah. there anything? Majority. Oh, one yeah, the one little comment you know, if there's a section of pipeline that has a lot of leaks, that's also a red flag that that is a priority main replacement. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. Once we get our model up and our GIS yeah. up, we'll be able to pull that yeah. information yeah. a lot easier. We can throw it right into our capital yeah, improvement program. This, this section of line had and X amount of leaks, or yeah. I can't wait for it to be fully functional. Okay. okay. We're moving that direction. All righty, I I. I think our reports are basically done here. Mm -hmm. So we can adjourn this you have, meeting. You have a few le uh, correspondence, I do believe. Oh, okay. You have the uh, um, the minutes from this uh, the LADAC committee meeting. Oh. The LADAC uh, should be in here. Yes, they from are the in last, there. I uh, just want to point out to you. 
Uh, then we have a few correspondence from a few folks. Right. And then the last thing is the uh, claim from uh, Terry Beer. Yep. Yep. Any other questions here? No? Oh, Debbie? I have a very quick comment on the last minute, so you will note we have hammered out a charter. So we'll be going yeah. back to the committee on next Tuesday for a final uh, acceptance, and we'll come to the board. And it's a broad charter. It's a really good charter. Excellent. Okay. Um, we'll adjourn now. It's 10 after 10. Whatever. <laughs> Another one.